Hey, before this video starts, I just wanted to announce that I put up the backgrounds that I made for Fossil Fighters 1, Champions, and Frontier up on Wallpaper Engine. If you'd like to have any of these as your wallpaper, all you have to do is download Wallpaper Engine on Steam and look up Fossil Fighters Scrolling BG and you should see the three I made along with a bonus one based on Ratsy. Oh, look at that, she blushes. This isn't really an ad since I'm not sponsored, nor am I making any money off of this. It's just a cool thing I decided to do, and I really have to thank Echo Space for leaving this comment. I would have never thought of this on my own, and it's just such a fun idea. The link's down below if you want to download for yourself, and I hope you enjoy the video. So, this video is probably coming out a lot sooner than some of you were expecting. Since I said to not really expect it anytime soon in the Arceus video, but in all honesty, it's just like I said in that video, I did not know how I was going to handle the making of this video. At first, I wanted to do another hour-long series retrospective, kind of like the Pokemon Ranger video. But after having all those issues trying to make that Arceus video, I decided I didn't want to do another hour-long video so soon after. <laughs> but the issue with that was I really wanted to make a Fossil Fighters video this year. So I compromised and decided to make three separate videos on the three Fossil Fighters games, instead of doing just one big video. However, I think I'll probably edit these three videos together at some point in the future, similar to what other creators do from time to time. A part of me isn't really satisfied with this compromise, since if I might edit them together anyways, why not just do that from the beginning? But meh, my intrusive feelings are usually wrong most of the time, so I'm just gonna ignore them. And besides, I think I'll have a lot more to say than I did in that Ranger video, so it's probably gonna be easier, and you know, just for the better in general, to make three separate videos, then sort of Frankenstein them together. But let's get on topic, shall we? Fossil Fighters, a series that was primarily developed by Red Entertainment and Nintendo, that released its first entry on the DS in Japan in 2008, and 2009 in North America and Australia. Fossil Fighters is a monster taming RPG that has the player dig up fossils to revive them into vivasaurs. Basically modified ancient creatures that can have different abilities and skills in combat that are contained in little dino metals or dino gears in the third game. Vivasaurs are used by people known as Fossil Fighters to do battle. As a Fossil Fighter, your goal is usually to become the strongest Fossil Fighter by digging up more and more fossils to collect and upgrade vivasaurs while dealing with some sort of evil plot done by some sort of evil group. Fossil Fighters as a series enjoyed a fairly average amount of success and it earned a very loyal fan base, but in modern day it's not really all that talked about unless a new game is rumored in some kind of E3 or direct leak, or if a popular YouTuber does a video on it. Sadly, Fossil Fighters is in the same situation as many other popular C-tier Nintendo franchises that only really get the bare minimum of love or acknowledgement from the big guys at Nintendo. Not helping Fossil Fighter's case is the fact many people compared it to Pokemon, saying it's not really on Pokemon's level, which I think is a terrible assumption, but not entirely unfair. Comparing Nintendo's two monster taming franchises is just a natural thing to do. And although Fossil Fighters does have its toes in other media like manga, Pokemon being the juggernaut that it is just completely flattened it. And when the final game in the series Frontier came out and was very controversial with fans and critics, yeah, Fossil Fighters never really came back from that. However, nowadays with monster taming games other than Pokemon reaching unprecedented levels of popularity, and the fact that Nintendo remade Advance Wars in a time where Fire Emblem has that genre on lockdown, I think the possibility of a comeback for Fossil Fighters is, you know, pretty high. I don't think I'd put money on that though, or the reliable leakers that promise it's going to be in the next Direct, but I think it has a pretty good shot. But now that you got the context around Fossil Fighters as a series, let's get started talking about the games. As mentioned before, Fossil Fighters 1 came out in 2008-2009 and started the C-tier Nintendo franchise. Fossil Fighters 1 has us play as a rookie Fossil Fighter on Vivasaur Island, who has to deal with threats to the world whether they be terrestrial or extra, as he builds his career and ranks up to become a master fighter. One of the first things you'll notice as you boot up this game is that Fossil Fighters decides to go the full 3D route with its visuals, 
which helps set itself apart from other RPGs on the DS. And that definitely shows in the Vivasaur fights, though the models and animations can look a bit stilted at first. I mean, just look at this poor guy run. But there is a reason I want to start on the visuals, as I think they are very interesting and work a lot better than they first appear. Starting with the overworld, the environments are all pretty cool and interesting, but when you get to the player and NPC models, they are very low poly and their animations are very stilted, most likely from what I believe to be a lack of development time. However, even if everything looks stilted, the animators do get really creative with what they're given. Yeah, it's not the most fluid dance in the world, but don't tell me you don't enjoy watching these characters do their ridiculous moves or just spin around and flop onto the floor. They get so creative with their own limitations, and they still make these characters feel so lifelike. They go this very cartoony route, and it's just so enjoyable watching your characters move and emote when it's still very clear how restricted it must have been to make them feel this expressive. Whether they're dancing, crying, or packing eight, they just feel so Life, I know I've like repeated myself like eight times, but it's so cool. You gotta believe me. Then we get to the Vivasaurs in battle. I think they share some of that stilted feeling from the overworld models, but you can definitely tell that this is where the animators spent most of their time, as all the animations are so well done and even have some cartoony movements and some of that squash and stretch to them, which makes them so fun to watch in action. A possible negative is how the animations are for the most part shared between Vivasaurs with the same base model. But you gotta remember, this is an RPG on the DS with over 100 controllable dinosaurs. So yeah, I can absolutely understand why they would have it like this. And just change a particle effect here or there, like if it's a fire or a water elemental or something. One thing I noticed that was a really cool way to save on DS memory, is how most of the attacks are technically just one long animation. And depending on the power of the attack, the animation will cut off at certain points. For example, let's look at how Spinax attacks. Comparing these two attacks, we can see that they are actually the same animation, it's just that the weaker one is cut off while the stronger one plays more of the animation. That's really cool, I love that level of ingenuity, it's just a very creative way to handle something like this. And it just speaks to the level of creativity the team had for Fossil Fighters. Creativity, that's just the perfect word for this game. Look at all these cool creative designs for not just the variety of Vivasaurs you get to use in battle, but for most of the characters you get to meet as well. The design work in this game is fantastic. Each of the characters have their own unique look that tells you a little bit about their personality, and the Vivasaurs take so much care and effort to look like these cool cartoony versions of dinosaurs, with some obvious creative liberties here and there to make them feel more unique, such as Krona's time theme being based on its Roman naming meaning Time Lizard. That's just plain creative, man, and just about each Vivasaur has that same amount of care and love put into their design. And it doesn't stop there. We'll get to the story in a bit, but let me just talk about this writing. It has no business being as good as it is. Like maybe the story isn't the best thing you'll ever read, but the way it's delivered has all the trappings of Bugs Bunny and Drama Club. The way everyone is talking and joking around is just fantastic. There will be a character in each and every chapter that will absolutely fascinate you with their delivery and their wit. For instance, this dimwit, Knickknack, and his obsession with weird items, funky speech patterns, and his absolute jam of a theme song. Exquisite. You gotta love everybody in this game. There's hardly a one without a neat detail or gimmick that just makes it feel like they've all been painstakingly written to entertain. And I think I'll leave it there as I don't want to spoil the game too much for you. That's why I'm putting the story towards the later part of this video. I want to genuinely direct people towards these games without ruining the fun, while still giving my thoughts for those who want to hear another perspective on the spoilers. But what's a game without gameplay? Oh, a movie! No, oh, it's a book! It's a spatula! Uh, Sony? That was rhetorical, but yes to all four. In Fossil Fighters you can do a variety of fossil related things, such as polluting the planet, such as using your trusty pickaxe and sonar to dig a two foot hole in the ground and finding a fossil. Then bringing that bad boy back to the lab to do a little deep clean. With a drill for precise cleaning and the hammer to actually get things clean. Personally, I feel like the hammer is the perfect tool. It, I mean honestly, when you can get away with it, it just gets everything cleaner, it's a lot faster, it's a lot stronger, it's a lot oops. Yeah, just be careful when cleaning not to damage it too much as it makes the fossil unrevivable. 
You can check the status of the fossil by looking up top. Cleaning is represented with the blue bar and the damage is shown with the red bar. To revive a fossil, the blue has to make it over the line right here, with every bit of blue afterwards going into the revived Vivasaur as bonus experience points. However, if the red gets over the bar, you've lost the fossil, but that's not all you gotta watch out for, as there is a time limit. For some reason, there's not really a line here, Doc. I think I can get away with taking my time on these extremely valuable, priceless fossils. But if you're not satisfied with the base equipment of your fossil fighter, you can upgrade your sonar, fossil inventory, and cleaning gear for a small- What the hell? Why is everything an arm and a leg here? How loaded do you have to be to get in this Jurassic Park BS island? If you want my recommendation, just focus on fossil chip upgrades as they're the ones you really need to find more fossils. And maybe go for inventory if money's burning a hole in your pocket. Everything else, either skip or upgrade if you need to, or if you're getting one too many normal rocks out there. And don't bother with the higher level cleaning equipment unless you absolutely need to, which most of you probably won't since these things aren't that much of an upgrade to be honest. But how does one go about obtaining money in Fossil Fighters? Well, when digging you'll come across some rocks with even more expensive rocks hidden inside them which is how you'll get most of your funds, but there are other ways. Just don't expect to get a lot of money out of those dung fossils. Ugh. I mean, if you clean a bunch of them, you can get a poop hat. I didn't really bother with that, but, you know, you, you're into that. But hey, for the most part, I really enjoy the digging and cleaning aspects of fossil fighters. It's a really creative use of the DS touchscreen, and I appreciate when a DS game uses the touchscreen for a creative use. Don't get me wrong, I don't mind a map or status screen, but some DS games just didn't really understand how to use the touchscreen effectively, or they just did something that was interesting, but could have been done more effectively with a D-pad and buttons. Oh, by the way, you don't have to blow on the mic to clean up the fossil dust on the screen. Blowing is a lot more immersive, stop it, but you can just use your hammer on the table to knock away the dust, or press L and R to instantly clean it instead of blowing it- Hey! This is a mature video about a kid's game. Have some respect. Now, for the main gameplay we're all here for. Violent, passionate, hip shaking! Nah, it's fossil battles, but the dialogue for the hip shaking is a bit, uh... Yeah, when they say E for everyone, they really meant E for everyone. Ain't no way a kid is getting these jokes, man. They gotta throw a parent a bone every once in a while. Kinda reminds me when I was a kid and I'd have someone read to me the dialogue for Pokemon or something. And now all I can imagine is a kid going, Ooh, Papa, you read the funny dinosaur words for me? Why certainly, my boy. Let me just take a look see. <gasps> Don't let your kids watch it! Anyways, the main gameplay I meant was the fossil battles. Fossil battles are a 3v3 turn-based battle system that involves us using our vivasaurs to try and beat our opponents. And I think it's time to go deeper into our prehistoric companions. Vivasaurs will all have an elemental typing based on six types. Earth, Air, Water, Neutral, and Legendary. Earth, Air, Water, and Fire are weak and strong against each other, best explained by this clockwise chart here. You're most likely familiar with elemental based strength and weakness type systems, and Fossil Fighters is probably the most simplistic, so you'll catch on quick with this one. And if you don't, the battle UI will tell you if a Vivasaur is strong or weak against another. But what about Neutral and Legendary? Well, Neutral is self-explanatory. It's neutral, not strong or weak against any other type. And Legendary is just neutral with sunglasses. They're the exact same type with only a color change. Like I said, the type system is pretty simple, and you know, that's by design, as Fossil Fighters puts more strategic stock in the individual quirks of each Vivasaur. There are different stats, different staff buffs or debuffs that they can put on either your or the opponent's Vivasaur, and where the Vivasaur likes to be positioned on the field. In Fossil Fighters, you can have a team of five Vivasaurs, but you're only allowed to bring three into battle, with those three being positioned on the different zones on the field the attack zone, two support zones, and the escape zone. The Vivasaur in the attack zone is right up front and can attack the three opposing Vivasaurs, but can also be attacked by all three opposing Vivasaurs as well. 
Oh, and keep in mind that attacks towards the support zones won't hit as hard as attacks towards the attack zone. The support zones are off to the side of the attack zone and can offer up that Vivasaur's unique support effects to either boost or weaken the Vivasaur's on the field. That all depends on the specific effects. Pay attention to those, by the way, as they can be massively helpful or massively hurtful to your team depending on the Vivasaur. The support zone Vivasaur may also attack the opposing attack zone Vivasaur, though the attack won't hit as hard. And they can't attack the opposing support zone Vivasaurs at all. The escape zone is where you can retreat your current attack zone Vivasaur to keep it from sustaining any more damage. However, it can't attack or perform any skills from this zone, and it must wait a few turns before being brought back into the fight. Though keep in mind you always have a Vivasaur in the attack zone. So if you retreat your AZ into the EZ, then your top SZ will take the place of your AZ. Then when your EZ Vivasaur comes back to fight, it will take the spot of your top SZ. Since you can only have one Vivasaur in a zone at a time, you dig? Now each Vivasaur has a preference as to which zone they like to inhabit on the field. You see, attack type Vivasaurs like to be up close and personal, so obviously they're perfect in the attack zone. Support type Vivasaurs are perfect for the support zone. Long range are actually pretty interesting as they don't lose any attack power when attacking in the support zone, nor do they lose any power when attacking the support zones in the attack zone. Though they can't hit the opposing attack zone as hard since it's too close. Defensive types are great sturdy walls and transformation type is unique to only three Vivasaurs that actually have the ability to transform into another Vivasaur. Then you have team skills which are essentially super moves which can be activated when your team has a similar diet or element but only when all three members are on the field. I didn't really use these for the most part, as you know, I like a variety of elements and Vivasaurs in a team, so none of my main team Vivasaurs were really all that compatible. I like to have a few different types of Vivasaurs, so I can have a strategy for any situation. It's a playstyle kind of thing. If you like similar Vivasaurs, you get a super move. If you're like me, you pretty much have a strategy for any situation. Oh, and a way to tell if your Vivasaurs can use a team skill is if they gleam when together on the team screen, so watch out for that. I know this all sounds really complicated when it's explained out like this, but it is really simple once you actually start playing the game. It, 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 it all comes to you pretty naturally. And even if you are having trouble, the game won't just drop all of this onto you. It starts simple and it gets more complex as you go. That being said, I really wouldn't worry too much if you're having a hard time learning the systems. As this game really isn't all that challenging, you know, save for a few fights here and there. As a general rule, just upgrade your Vivasaurs when you get the chance and just make sure you're paying close attention to the fight. And you probably won't lose. This game isn't really all that hard till you get to like the post game. That's when they drop the really hard fights onto you. But with all that being said, it's time for story. So skip here if you want to stay unspoiled if you decided to play this game for yourself. We start off as a kid heading off to Vivasaur Island, dreaming to become a fossil fighter and battle our way to become the best. The captain of the boat we're riding on asks us a few questions including our name and what kind of dinosaur we like. Your answer of dinosaur actually decides what your character's color scheme is and a free fossil you'll get later. For the name I went with Hunter as that's the main character's name in the manga and I actually read the first chapter of the manga for this video and... From what I can tell, it's a cute little retelling of the game where the main character has the ability to read his Spinex's thoughts, even as a fossil and is very masterful with cleaning tools as he made a house for his Spinex fossil. Though the manga was never finished in English, here's a YouTube link to a playlist containing some of the manga chapters. Once Hunter reaches Vivasaur Island, he gets set up with all the basics of a fossil fighter, including his own Vivasaur, and he gets to meet some of the island's residents, including Dr. Diggins, who created the revival machine and is, and is just the general science guy of the island. Though he is kooky, he's a great person to be around, but maybe not all that great to work for. Mr. Richmond is the owner of the island, who's a pretty jolly sort of person and he's very helpful, especially since our man Hunter here is always saving and keeping an eye on his granddaughter Rosie. Rosie is our little friend throughout the game. She's a bit spoiled, but for the most part is just a great character to have around. She seems to always get in some sort of trouble leaving Hunter to come save her, but that's part of what makes her so fun. Rosie's a great little character. To antagonize, I mean I just love messing with Rosie. It's always so funny to see her problems multiply as the game goes on. And I love how everybody just takes the piss out of her whenever the chance is given. However, no matter what happens, she's a loyal companion to Hunter here and they have a fun little friendship. 
that sort of blossoms into some sort of puppy love, but at least from Rosie's end. Hunter is absolutely a dinos before hoes kind of man. Oh yeah. But nevertheless, they have a fun dynamic. I say dynamic like Hunter here ever says anything. He does react to a few things throughout the story, but he's a silent protagonist. And even if he wasn't, I doubt he would be any more done with Rosie's shit. Bro, how did you even get to the moon? Do you want the long answer, or do you want to come up here and save me before my last 15 minutes of oxygen run out, Hunter? So how about we start with breakfast? Did you have your usual, or did you run out of truffle oil for your caviar? Hunter. There's also the Digga Dig tribe, a group of people native to Vivasaur Island who seem to have a deeper relationship to the fossils and are the masters of busting it down. Also magic, apparently, as they use it to give Rosie a much better Digga dialect. Hunter's main goal is to become a master fighter, and to do this he has to win level up battles where he has to pass a fossil cleaning test, then complete a series of battles. Ending off with him fighting the master of that level, which is usually whatever side character had a role during that chapter. Which I kinda like as a lot of these characters are fun and it's interesting to see what kind of vivasaurs they use. I'm a sucker for seeing people's teams in monster taming games, as I think you can tell a lot about a person from what monsters they use. One of the big time characters you'll meet is Sorehead, a monster of a man that's pretty much the toughest guy on the island. Though he is kind of a jerk at first, but when you get to know him you realize he's a pretty respectable guy who just loves fossil battles. His fans are genuine jerks though, they never really get any better. As Hunter challenges his way through the ranks, he'll come across a bunch of villains, including the BB Bandits. Primarily the trio of Vivian, Snivels, and Rex. They're basically like Team Rocket for most of the game, causing trouble with Hunter having to stop them and... Yeah, I can see you staring. Yes, according to the wiki, Rex is a dog. He's not like a short dog minotaur or something, he's just a dog that stands on two legs and can participate in fossil battles. And has an awkward amount of knowledge about volcanoes. Also, he has a British accent if his barks are translated. My theory is he's some kind of volcano spirit, but we just don't have enough information to really narrow down what he is or how he works. And nobody in game really cares enough to figure him out, so we'll just ignore his possible origins. Anyway, the trio is usually causing trouble for a bunch of different characters throughout the game, including a junk guy, a ghost pirate, and a... a beautiful woman. What happened to dinos before hoes? That's Hunter's vibe, not mine. Besides, only a real man like me can handle this kind of woman like her. Watch and learn, kids. Back to the BB Bandits, their deal is they're looking for these ancient idol statues. Now for some reason Hunter is awarded with these statues throughout the games for helping people. I guess cause nobody else wants anything to do with these ancient priceless artifacts. And you really can't let the evil guys win so why not just give them to the 12 year old. At the near half point of the game, the BB Bandits head honcho Bulwart decides to just kidnap Rosie and will only let her go if Hunter gives up the idols. Which does sound like a decent plan, but I guess Bulwart decided at some point to just say to hell with the plan and instead of a trade, a BB soldier was just sent out to attack Hunter? Which goes about as well as you'd expect it to, honestly. Why didn't he at least send the trio to handle this? I mean, they wouldn't have won either, but, you know, they're stronger than some dime a dozen goon. Then, you know, Hunter realizes what's up and just steals the soldier ship, which conveniently has the coordinates to Bulwark's secret base already inputted to the autopilot. So maybe this was part of his plan, or maybe his soldiers are just too stupid to remember the coordinates. It's about a 50-50 shot between those. Anyway, this leads to Hunter, the 10-year-old, mind you, 
to completely decimate the BB's forces and save Rosie, throwing Bulwart's whole crew in jail and keeping the idols safe from him. So really great plan, buddy, really worth you giving up your powerful position as the island's main police chief. Wait, why didn't you just use your police chief position to just ask for the idols? Not really sure of your thought process here, if there was one at all. But you know, it was made clear that Bulwart isn't the main bad guy, you know. And the main bad guy actually ends up freeing Bulwart and his crew from jail, leading to Bulwart to decide to steal a very powerful Vivisaur and then using that Vivisaur to take over the island. So it's kind of like he's won, but then he decides to treat his underlings like crap, leading them to rebel and help Hunter get the other legendary Vivisaur. That cancels out his Vivisaur, and then both of the legendaries are turned to dust or something, and then he's just thrown back in jail. Also, the legendaries are pretty ugly, honestly. I'm really glad they got redesigned in the next game. Also, stop gaslighting me, game. That is not a T-Rex. You have the model for one, so why did you use that one? Anyway, back to the BB Bandits. It's, you know, they're entertaining but it's probably for the best that they're only a stepping stone towards the real big bads, who actually end up helping you because, you know, they're sick of Bulwark too. You just don't appreciate anything, do you? Ah, oh, man, it's hard to insult a guy whose name is already Bulwark. It's like kicking him while he's already down. But then again, you know, feeling sorry for him is probably already enough of an insult to him. Anyone else thinks he looks like a Dino Thunder Ranger? I, I think it's the white stripes that are throwing me off. There are some other villains in this game, you know, like this thief guy at the beginning of the game and Blambo who appears in some side quests, but they're not really all that important, which, you know, is lucky for Hunter since Blambo doesn't get enough screen time to just get the idea to aim that shotgun just a little bit lower and BOW! Shoot Hunter right in the face. What? But what? D don't give me that look. They gave him a gun, all right? It's not my fault if I think about it, okay? Well, after taking back the island from Bulwark is when things really get going. Throughout the game, you meet and are spied on by this lady named Duna. After Hunter digs up the final idol, she reveals herself as a Dinarian. Pretty much aliens that use some sort of hologram or some kind of technology to become dinosaurs. I'm not really sure how it works, and the game doesn't really explain it. But the Dinarians are the ones who are the real villains of this game. They were the ones who hired Bulwart and they are packing some serious technology, including some heat! <laughs> Get it? Heat? Because they're in a volcano? Anyway, she uses her dino form and some dino bots to try and fight Hunter, but she loses. And that's when she starts to develop a CRUSH on Hunter! <laughs> uh. Anyway, she develops a crush on him after he saves her from being crushed to death. Look, there's a comment session for a reason. If they're bad, just let me know, okay? She later reappears to help Hunter revive the legendary Vivisaur. Then sometime after that, she has a conversation with Hunter about humans and Dinarians, and how they may not be so different after all. And before you ask, no. Hunter has no interest in Duna, because she's a hoe first, dino second. After saving the island and earning another member to his harem that he really wishes he didn't have, Hunter wakes up to the Richmond building being attacked by the Dinarians, turning people into rats with their rat rays, including Rosie. This is a good look for her. Anyway, the Dinarians reveal that they're here for the idols that they refer to as the subcomps before they teleport away. But right before then, Ratsy jumps in and attacks! She fails, but she managed to grab a teleporter button with her little rat hands. Hunter and Diggins, being the chads they are, decide to teleport to the Dinarians, but they decide they need disguises because I guess the champion mask isn't dinosaur enough? Alright. So Hunter then challenges Sorehead to an honorable, quotation marks, combat to obtain two of his dino first, I mean, the uh, sore masks. Yeah, masks. Don't worry about Sorehead, though. He keeps 30 dino suits on at all times to protect his identity, like the chad he is. Hunter and Diggins then perform a potentially racist plan to put on Greenface and sneak onto the ship and steal back the idols. The plan almost succeeds, but then the two are interrupted by Duna's Dinarian betrayal. 
You see, the Dinarians once lost their homeworld, and about 3 million or so years ago, they came up with this plan to make a new one by planting life on a planet that would one day become Earth. And they set up the little idle chicken computer things to make sure that the life they planted would one day evolve into more Dinarians. The Dinarians then put themselves into a stone-like sleep to wait for their plan to work and, you know, wake up to a new utopia of Dinarians. But at some point in time, the little chickens flew the coop from the Dinarian ship and landed on Earth, leading to the Dinarians waking up to an Earth that evolved humans instead of Dinarians. Now, the plan is to get back the tacky chicken idols to try and restart life on the planet and try the whole new Dinarian thing again. Duna is ordered to activate the idols, but she refuses, saying it's wrong to do this to the humans and the animals of the planet. But Dinel, the king of the Dinarians, isn't really having it, and at this point is when Hunter jumps in to defend Duna, leading to some more Dinobots being sicked on him. After besting the machines, Dinel is really not having it, and he decides to just press the button himself, leading us to believe we were too late to save our planet Earth. But that's when Diggins, being the Chad he is, manages to remove one of the idols causing a chain reaction that ends up stopping the heinous experiment and sending Diggins and the idol back in time, far from Dinel's reach, with Duna and Hunter escaping back to Earth in the chaos. Once they get back to the Richmond building, they reason that the missing sub-comp idol chicken is probably still out there, and so they make a device that finds that the missing CIC is split into five pieces scattered around the island. Yay, backtracking. Woo! Wow! Wow! Really wish it was just two pieces and we got to check out those two post-game areas instead. Anyway, lame backtracking later, Duna realizes we're still missing the core of the idol. So she asks Richmond if he knows somewhere on the island that their scans couldn't detect. Richmond tells us about the secret island that is actually an old Dinarian ship. It's where he and Diggins found the old stone sleep technology and reverse engineered it to make the fossil reviving system. Funny how Dinarians use the tech to preserve while humans use it to restore. Not really going anywhere with that thought, I just, you know, was thinking that was kind of interesting. Duna and Hunter then reach the secret island, and this is where Duna starts to tell Hunter about the living weapon Ganache. Basically, he's a Galactus type figure who ate the Dinarian's homeworld. And the reason this ship crashed all those years ago is because they were studying a piece of it that went berserk and crashed the ship. Every molecule of that thing is a weapon. Anyway, we found Diggins' half-frozen corpse, yay! Apparently he made his way here after being flung back in time by the chicken, and like the Chad he is, he scienced up the ship and activated a stone sleep device. You really can't keep a king down, I tell ya. Then Raptin comes in, and wait, I, I I haven't mentioned him yet. He's basically Duna, but he's a boy, and he's loyal to Dinel. Anyway, he comes in, and he starts talking some smack before he gets smacked by Hunter. Hunter, Duna, and a half-dead Diggins then get back to base, where they try to revive Diggins with the Fossa Oops. After fixing up the idol, we meet up with Richmond, who asks to hold Hunter's chicken, which Hunter happily obliges, but HA! It was actually Dinel in disguise, who then shoots Rosie in the face, and then makes a break for it. Could have tackled him, Hunter, I'm just saying. The team then all comes together to decide that the 10-year-old should storm the spaceship, and he does, making it just in time before Dinel activates the extinction machine. However, this time around, Dinel is sick of this crap and he decides to handle Hunter himself. He ends up getting handled instead. But cool battle background though. Dinel realizes that maybe Duna was right, and then Hunter offers the Dinarians a home on Earth to live alongside the humans, and Dinel seems pretty for it, finally bringing us to a peaceful resolute not. Cause Raptin is here and he isn't having any of this, so he presses the button and starts up the machine. But as the machine readies itself, the sub chicks come to life, and explained what happened to them all those years ago. They said they were made to regulate life planted by the Dinarians on Earth all those years ago, to make sure everything went according to plan. But it turns out the Dinarians' plan was flawed pretty early on. The life they planted all those years ago all died out and only a hundred to a thousand years in meaning all their efforts would have been for a waste, and they would have woken up to a barren world. However, the chickens noticed that the Earth itself soon started to create its own life. 
that would one day become all the humans, animals, plants, dinosaurs, etc. we know today. The idols wanted to leave Earth to her own devices, considering all the Dinarian stuff was long dead and would have failed no matter what. But the head cock of this chicken farm wanted to completely eradicate all life on Earth through the use of, get this, ganache, which it tried to summon, but the chicks flew the coop before the rooster could signal ganache. However, now that Raptin pushed the button and activated the machine with all the sub idols installed, that means the main idol's last signal has been sent out. And Ganache is now on his way here. Ah, shit. Obviously, Dinale and the rest of the Dinarians are mortified to have made another planet a potential victim of Ganache, and they team up with the humans to try and figure out a way to save humanity. At first, they try to come up with a way to use their spaceship to get humanity to safety, and even Duna and Dinale volunteer to stay behind to allow two more humans to leave in their place. But as Richmond points out, there's too many humans to fit on that ship, and they don't have time to make the necessary adjustments. It all seems hopeless. Till the definition of King Shit himself walks up and casually states he has a plan to kill Galactus. My. Mother. Fucking. Man! Diggins says he used his time in the past to study the Ganache sample on the ship, and he reasons that all you have to do to kill Ganache is to simply destroy the three brains controlling the beast. Rosie asks if we have any weapons to take out the brains, which, yep, way ahead of you on this one, Rosie. Oh, I wish that's how it went down. But Diggins says that we already have all the muscle we need. The Vivasaurs. And since Hunter is the best fighter, the 10-year-old once again readies himself to take on another challenge. But before he goes, Rosie and Duna volunteer to go with Hunter. You can only take one other person with you, so it's up to you who comes with. Starting off with the Rosie route, Rosie says she knew you'd pick her as Duna just stares off into the distance. Probably a little sad. Dinell hands Rosie a communications device and something else before the two of you are teleported. You and Rosie wake up wondering where you are, with Rosie commenting on how gross everything is around you, before Dinell radios in to tell you that you're standing in Ganache's mouth, as that's where his brains are located. After some dialogue, Hunter and Rosie can feel the brains on their way to them, as they both walk bravely towards them. After defeating the brains, Ganache's body starts to detonate, with Dinell radioing in to tell them that he can't teleport them out due to the amount of energy Ganache is sending out. He then tells Rosie that the second device he gave her was a mini stone sleep device, and that they can use it to seal themselves away to survive the explosion, and then their friends will come pick them up later. Rosie tells Hunter to hold her hand tightly as they transform as the monster explodes, leaving them adrift in space together in stone sleep. After returning to Earth, there is some bad news. Hunter was able to be revived out of stone sleep just fine, but Rosie has ended up losing her memories. Hunter runs off to where his friend is, where he finds that it's true, and that Rosie has sadly lost all of her memories. But hope is not lost, however, as the Digga Dig Chief comes in, and tells Hunter to use his vigorous and passionate hip shaking to perform the dance that will awaken Rosie. And of course this somehow works, and Rosie Digga Digs up all her old memories. Okay, going to block Richmond's comment out of my memory. We then see a title sequence of all the characters, including the one where we see Duna trying to make friends with some humans, only for them to start simping for her. Yep, the apparently 14 year old. Uh, actually, she's 3 million and 14. Dude, that is even worse. Stop it. Yeah. We then end on a cute moment where Hunter and Rosie talk about how proud she is of you and how she'll be sticking by Hunter. It's a really cute scene, and it's a good way to wrap up their friendship. Thank you for not going the love route, by the way. I think that fiction is a bit too trigger-happy when it comes to romantic relationships, and when it comes to games with younger child demographics in mind, I think it's a good idea to help younger kids to understand that just being friends is okay. You can give Rosie a bit of puppy love here and there, or have Duna thank Hunter with a kiss, but I think it's better for these characters and for their demographic to just be happy with friendship. No need to tell kids to find their soulmate by 10, that's pretty ridiculous. If we were to choose Duna instead of Rosie, we would have had a similar but still different set of events. 
For instance, when you choose Duna, Rosie is seen getting a little pissed off in the background before letting it go and waving Hunter and Duna goodbye. We see Duna go ahead and join Hunter on the teleporter as she already has the mini stone sleep device and the communicator. When you arrive in Ganesh's mouth, she fills you in on the whole situation instead of Dinell having to call in, showing that she was already informed about all this beforehand. Afterwards, Duna and Hunter walk bravely towards the Three Brains. And then after destroying the Three Brains, they still activate the Stone Sleep right before the explosion. They try to teleport out, but Ganesh is exposing too much energy just like before, and luckily Duna came prepared, telling Hunter to hold her hand as they turn the stone. After waking up back on Earth, Hunter is informed that there was a problem with Duna's stone sleep, causing her to still be sealed inside. The Dinarians are preparing to leave with Duna out into space to try and find a cure, but Hunter makes it just in time to see her. All hope seems lost till the Digga Dig Chief himself claims to have a way to save her. He explains through a vision given to him by the Fossil God. The Fossil God? The Fossil God! Yeah, Fossil God. I, I don't know, it was never explained before. It's never even come up before, but, you know, whatever. The vision told him that through vigorous and passionate hip shaking, that you can use the Earth's power to free her. And it works, and Duna is free, and ow, ow, Dinel, not you too. The credits play, and instead of a scene with Duna, we now have a scene with Rosie going to talk to Hunter. <laughs> but... <laughs> But somehow she gains back her Digga dialect <laughs> and her mouse form. <laughs> oh, much to her horror. <laughs> oh, this is a lot better than the <laughs> We then end on a scene with Duna and Hunter. Here, Duna tells how because of Hunter, the Dinarians finally have a new home here on Earth, and she's very grateful. She claims to be Hunter's biggest fan, and she won't stay too far away from him. For similar reasons to the Rosie ending, I also like this one with Duna. Of course comes the question of which ending is the better one. Both Rosie and Duna are built up well throughout the game, and I like both of the final scenes, as of course, as Hunter's closest friend, Rosie would want to be the one to congratulate him, while Duna is forever grateful to Hunter for showing her the error of her ways and because he gave her people a new home. I like both, but I personally pick Duna. If I was gonna fight Ganesh myself, I'd probably want the person who's more informed of what I'm getting into. Plus, between her and Rosie, I get the feeling Duna is the better fighter, but that's impossible to really know. Also, the Rosie scene is hilarious, so that's an extra 10 bonus points to Duna right there. And that's pretty much the story of Fossil Fighters. I could probably go into the post game, but Honestly, it's your standard fare of rematches, allowing you to catch legendaries, etc. But I did mention the post-game areas. I'll talk about them a little later when we're outside of spoilers. I know that's odd, but I have my reasons. Also, watch out for that Dinarian fight. I, uh, I didn't beat that one. Anyways, I really enjoy the story of Fossil Fighters. It's got this whole Saturday morning cartoon-like feel with lots of heart and character. The plot really starts getting good around the introduction of the Dinarians, as they brought a much more serious tone to the story while still laughing with the player most of the time. And oh man, it's so cool how things are set up at the beginning. Things like looking for the sandal fossils for Nick Knack and them turning out to be the ones Diggins lost in the past is really cool, and you wouldn't expect them to have a tie into the story because they're just as random as the other items Nick Knack asks you to find. And then when the Dinarians realize that they just brought Doom onto another planet, and you can feel the dread in Dinel as he realizes he's just as bad as Ganache, ooh, that's gut wrenching. You know, it's kind of odd how the characters don't seem to care when the possibility of just being an accident of Dinarian science comes around. Would have liked to see them really question things before being put to ease after the idols tell them that they are natural from the Earth, and that the plan failed along before Earth's natural life came around. I guess it's really not a negative that they don't address that, it's just more of a missed opportunity. Though the story and the characters are great. Not a lot to complain about except maybe Bulwart, but he plays his role well, I guess. I don't know, maybe more stuff for characters like Holt would have been cool. 
But like he doesn't really do anything all that important to the overall story so I'd say he's fine where he is as an early game potential rival. But I guess they do give him something else to do and if we're being honest I like Holt but I really wouldn't want him to take any screen time for more interesting characters like Rosie or Duna. It just kind of feels weird how he's introduced as a potential rival and he ends up not doing a lot at the end of the day, you know? Alright, spoiler free peeps ought to be back by now. Sorry that you had to miss half the video, but I respect you for sticking around. Anyway, now that you're back, it's time to talk about the two post-game areas. Wait, 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 wait. Don't worry. I know these count as spoilers but I think it may be better for you to hear what I got to say because you might miss out on certain things and this is my only real critique of the game. These two post-game areas should have been in the main game. They have all these cool exclusive vivisaurs that can only be found here and randomly at the shop and I do mean random so don't bet on using these guys before post-game. Which, you know, it is cool to have new Vivasaurs in the post-game, but I really would have preferred these guys be around in the main adventure instead of shoving them in the post-game, which is just kind of lame. Not to mention, having these two areas in the main game could have really brought up a fairly boring part of it. For the spoiler-free, during the game there is a backtracking segment that goes on a bit too long, and it really feels like it's just padding for time. So instead of revisiting five areas we've already seen before, I think it would have been a much better and interesting idea for the player to travel around to these two new locations instead, as it would have added some variety to an otherwise boring section. You could even incorporate the two story things going on in those areas, the Yeti and the Oasis, neither of which I got much footage of since I think I did something wrong in the wrong order or something. Or maybe you're stuck to one post-game quest at a time between the two. 20,000 for a seed, by the way, is way too much. And before you ask, no, I don't have any footage of the Yeti. Because I couldn't get his quest to start. Because I think he has a $20,000 item too. And you can't buy both at the same time, leaving one kind of out to dry for these sections. I have no idea. But even with all my issues, my overall view of this game stays the same. Which obviously, yeah, I love this game. I could go off listing things, but I feel like I've talked your ear off already with the positives, and not everything has to be formatted like a five paragraph essay. This game is fantastic. Just about everything is wonderful, including the music, which I didn't really talk about all that much, but let's be honest. This OST would be a 10 out of 10, even if it was just the single knickknack theme. But the rest is all very well done. Maybe not everything is memorable, but the ones that are really stick with you, man. We got some cool tribal music with some nice percussion and chanting. Or how about this cool space theme for something I can't show spoiler-free people? and some big tough guy music that's loud and proud as it should be. Each one of the songs fits their settings fairly well, with a few outliers like the sunken ship not really feeling all that piratey. But hey, it's still got this neat sneaking around feel that kind of makes sense as it seems everybody's sneaking around these places. Ah oh man, I forgot the announcers. Meh, it'll be fine. Not really sure how they follow us around everywhere, but then again annoying people pop out of the ground everywhere, so... Who knows, the announcers are entertaining, but maybe don't take their battle advice as it is. Add a pinch of salt and you'll be fine. Though they can give a half decent tip every once in a while. Oh right, I was doing an outro. TLDR, Fossil Fighters is a really fun monster taming game. If you're interested in what you've seen thus far, I'd say definitely check it out. It's a wonderful experience and it's really fun. But watch out for those prices, they are way too expensive. Look for the cheapest you can find, or just pirate it. I didn't pirate it, I legally dumped my copy. 
but I can't blame anyone for pirating at this point. Look at these prices, retro collecting is just a scam right now. Man, it was a good thing I cut the last video where I did. When I get started talking about retro game collecting, I can't help but go down a rabbit hole of how it's overpriced, how companies like Nintendo need to do better, and how piracy is tied into all that. And although that conversation is relevant to Fossil Fighters, it's not what you're here for, and it's a bit of a downer anyway. Though, if that is what you're here for, uh, uh sorry, I guess. But let's get on topic. A few years after Fossil Fighters stomped and roared onto the scene, a sequel was released in 2010 for Japan and 2011 for the US, known as Fossil Fighters Champions, and spoiler alert, but this game is what many will tell you is the best in the series. And a quick spoiler alert for my own opinions, but I find that statement hard to argue. Fossil Fighters Champions doesn't just come out of the gate swinging, it pretty much blows said gate off of its hinges, and takes everything from the original and turns it up to not just 11, but 12. I don't think it's a perfect game, but it is one hell of a sequel. So how about we skip the foreplay and get right into why in God's name did I start a video about a children's dinosaur game like that? What is wrong with me? Starting off with the visuals once again, it's very clear that the visual teams got a lot better in a short span of time. This game's visuals are the reason I believe that the original's look was due to a lack of development time. Champions blows the first game out of the water when it comes to visuals. The overworld models are a lot more detailed, all the backgrounds and areas are a lot fuller, and realized with different unique eye-catching elements such as this giant skull-shaped rock, a volcano with horn-shaped rocks, an area where instead of traveling along the x-axis you travel up and down on the z-axis along a rock face. Okay, there's a lot more than just a bunch of interesting rocks, but you get what I'm saying. Champions has a lot more varied and more detailed filled locations. And while the first game did have some interesting places to check out, a lot of them were just differently colored flat areas. While Champions adds some verticality to the mix, like with this petrified wood area. Wait, that just counts as another interesting rock, doesn't it? Fuck! Though a big L to all my desert-loving viewers, as the desert in Champions is way worse than the one in the original. As this one is just a little room with a cutscene, I guess they ran out of ideas for this part? Probably should have just cut it out, all things considered, or maybe put a certain plot important location here. I mentioned the overworld models, and yes, this is the most night and day difference in the visual department as all the characters are properly more detailed and animated, though I do miss those funny little animations from the original. Don't get me wrong, Champions has its fair share of cartoony animations, but it doesn't really hit the same as those in the original. I get that those were the way they were due to limitations, and I'm not asking for whatever the hell this run cycle was to come back, but I feel that a little of the charm is kinda runned off, though I do mean a little, a lot of the charm is here. What I'm talking about is really only a nitpick at the end of the day, and that doesn't really affect my opinion of the game, I just... I don't know, I just kinda missed it. Though, it's time to tackle the elephant in the room, and that's how blurry this game can look. And there's no avoiding it, that's the look the team went for, it's not me making it all pixely. The game's art design called for it to be blurry, and I think it works in the game's favor. Look, detail on the DS wasn't exactly easy, and as though the little system could outdo systems like the N64 or PlayStation, there was no getting around that tiny screen, and the little system can only do so much, it wasn't a portable GameCube or PS2. So the blurry look was a best of both worlds, giving the illusion to massive amounts of detail while still fitting it in a tiny screen. And, you know, if we're being honest, me blowing it up for the video like this is probably just making the whole blurry thing look a lot worse than it actually is. Sorry, I guess, that's, it's kind of unavoidable, really. But the developers made the right decision. The blur can make things look more detailed than they appear to be, saving space on the DS cart while still making things look impressive for the time. And if you remember, I had these same thoughts on the battle animations last time. The teams behind Fossil Fighters were really smart people. Instead of being discouraged by how limiting the DS could be, they saw it as a challenge to either skirt around or outsmart, and they did. Besides, they needed that extra space for something extra special. 
FMVs, full motion video. These types of pre-rendered cutscenes were quite common on the home consoles, but not really as much on the handheld side, well, I should say not really on the Nintendo handheld side. As the GBA could do FMVs, but it was really the DS that brought that kind of stuff into more prominence on the Nintendo end. And Champions here has decided to use it for itself really strutting the team's animation chops to make some entertaining and well-done cutscenes. Sure, maybe it would have been better to have these voiced instead of just text, but hey, that would have been kind of an unreasonable ask in this situation, and especially with the DS's vocal quality... It would have made for some funny memes, though. But the visuals weren't the only thing that got quite the upgrade. The overworld gameplay for the most part is the same as the originals. You still walk around and search using your radar to find fossils. Not too much to really talk about there, all this is the same. Except for the mask system. Now last time I neglected to really mention masks as they were only a small cosmetic thing in the game, though the BB mask did make some funny little walking noises. But now in Champions there are a few masks that actually have some more practical uses, such as helping you look for some specific typed fossils which can really help when you're trying to find specific fossils. Most of the time, but I think I'll save that issue for a little later. But generally, some masks have some more practical uses now outside of just being cosmetic. Now let's talk fossils themselves. Champions brings back all the types of fossils from the first game, while adding in some interesting new ones into the mix, along with a few real game changers. But before that, thank you for making money an absolute non-issue, you get diamonds like it's nothing now, and I understand that it's OP for the player to earn enough money to buy all the upgrades early on in the game this way. But I felt like most of the shop upgrades from last time were really a waste of money or should have just been included in the player's tool set already. So I really don't care about it to be honest. But yeah, my problem with jewel rocks and money in the first game is pretty much a non-issue in Champions. Now for the new fossil rocks. The new ones include giant fossil rocks which pretty much take up the whole screen and the player has to move their field of view around to really get all the fossil clean. Then we have curious fossil rocks. These types actually can't be fully cleaned by only doing one side. So the player has to flip them around to actually get that sucker clean. Admittedly these two new types aren't really all that interesting. You're pretty much just cleaning two to four fossils with the challenge being having more to clean before the usual time runs out. Which once again, there isn't really a line dude, not sure why I can't take my time with these. Though, that's where the two new consumable items come in. Buster probes which show you a special spot to hit in rapid succession with your hammer to clean a fossil faster and more efficiently, and time probes which give the player extra time when used. Now I know both of these sound like great ways for the player to try and clean these behemoth fossils, and you know what? You'd be right when it comes to the time probe. But for some reason, the buster probe doesn't work on these two new types. Which doesn't make a lick of sense to me. I kind of feel like these two fossils would be perfect for the buster probes. I mean, these and time probes are expensive for a reason. They're powerful tools for a big job like the giant and curious fossils. I mean, at least buster probes are still really useful for other types of fossils. Well, except for the other two new fossil types that I'll talk about in a second, but yeah, buster probes just aren't all that great, unless you want to ease your time with most of the regular fossils. Now I'm sure the reason why buster probes don't work is to incentivize the new mechanic of using DS wireless play to team up with a friend and clean up a fossil together. Did anyone ever do that? Alright, come on now, raise your hands. One, two, three. Yeah, that's about as many as I figured. I'll grant you that it's a cool idea, but I feel the execution left a lot to be desired. But don't worry my single player brethren, you can still stock up on time probes and just brute force it. It's, I guess it's really not a big deal. Now what is a big deal are these two powerhouses, Miraculous and Curious Fossils. Now, what seems to be just a spray-painted dinosaur skull is actually the radioactive missing link of all life on the planet. Or at least that's my headcanon as there's no logical explanation as to why inserting a random skull causes a bibisword to gain a power boost and a color change. And there's definitely no explanation as to why it turns some vivasaurs into mutants, a god, 
dragons, another god, Godzilla. It's really weird and really awesome. Basically, each part of the silver fossil gives a different stat boost and a color scheme for each vivasaur, except for legendaries. The gold fossil gives a huge stat boost to all stats, including super evolving some specific vivasaurs into stronger forms. Obviously, gold fossils are a lot harder to come by in game, but for the most part, the super ones are pretty plentiful. You should have at least one for each of your main vivasaur team members. I love the mechanics around these two new types of fossils as they can really give a cool power boost to all of your vivasaurs, and this super evolver shit right here is just cool. And don't go thinking you're the only one with these shiny things, the NPCs use them quite frequently too, so don't get too comfy, alright? This isn't Megas or Z moves, you'll definitely find some random Joe Schmo with an Odin or something, it's really cool. Though I do have one issue. There's no way to store these fossils for later, and yeah, with most other fossils that's not a big deal, but for the shiny fossils, they either rot away in your fossil case until you want to use it, or you do use it and you find it's not the part of the skeleton you wanted and you use it on a vivasaur you're not using or you just make your snake monotone. I kind of wish there was a way to know if the shiny is an arm, leg, or something beforehand. You can look it up online, but I wish there was a way in game. Or maybe if the game just asks you if you want to store a completed fossil for later. Yeah, I know, another nick 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 pick for the pile. Now for the Vivasaurs themselves, a lot of what you remember from the first game carries over pretty well. Vivasaurs still come in one of five types, and they each have a different class that kind of tells you the range they prefer to be in. And team skills are still very much around. These three attributes have received minor to no changes, save for something like team skills now being usable even if one or more team members is defeated, though the team skill does lose power for every member downed. But yeah, otherwise, if you're familiar with the first game, you'll fit right in, so let's get into the new stuff. For starters, we have a few new Vivasaurs added into the mix, including some with brand new models, like the new Mollusks, a new Turtle model, a Snake, some Dunkles, and of course all the new Super Evolvers. These new Vivasaurs are really cool and really fill out the ranks with some other prehistoric creatures that the first game didn't really get around to including. Though, of course, there are some other interesting Vivasaurs and we'll talk about them a little later. Now, let's look at the bank system, which allows you to store your Vivasaurs for later. Yeah, like this guy says, it doesn't sound very useful at first, but he goes on to explain that you can actually use this system to gain multiples of the same Vivasaur. In the original Fossil Fighter, you could only have one of each Vivasaur. For example, let's say you have the one Spinex. So, whenever you'd clean a Spinex fossil, it would be integrated into your one Spinex. No matter how many of those fossils you cleaned, it'd all be integrated into the same Spinex. But with the new bank system, you have the option to bank a Spinex for later, and then clean a Spinex fossil and gain another Spinex, allowing you the ability to have multiples of the same Vivasaur, even having a whole team of them if you want. Which is a major thing, as you couldn't do that in the originals, and with the introductions of silver and gold fossils, now you can have every color of Spinex under the sun, with all of them having different stat boosts, and although I didn't do this for myself, the NPCs did this sort of thing plenty. Really showing off that having multiples of the same Vivasaur on a team isn't a bad strategy at all. So if you want to go down that route, you know, just uh, do it. Now, for the biggest gameplay difference, the battle system. Similarly to the last game, the battles are set up as a 3v3 turn-based system, with you being allowed to bring 5 Vivasaurs on your person, but only using up to 3 of them in battle. Now, where we differ from the first game is the zones. In the first game, there was 3 zones, attack, 2 support, and an escape zone to escape damage. In Champions, there's only 2 zones, but both have 3 little spots where the whole range thing comes into effect. When you go into battle, you pick between 2 formations. The Jurassic formations lets you have 2 Vivasaurs in the attack zone, and one Vivasaur in the support zone, with that one Vivasaur in the support zone splitting its support effects between the two attackers and the opponents. In the Cambrian formation, you have one Vivasaur in the attack zone and two in the support zone. Then those two support zone Vivasaurs give both their effects to the one attack zone and the opponents like the first game. Yeah, no escape zone this time around, which I'm completely fine with. I didn't find the escape zone all that useful in the first game, and spoiler alert for a couple minutes later, 
I really enjoy this battle system more, so I don't miss the escape zone at all. Now with this new setup comes a few new things you can do. For instance, the two formation options are only how you start the battle. You can move around your Vivasaurs for a small power cost at any time, and it will even refund the cost if you change your mind and move your Vivasaurs back to where they were. So move your guys around a little bit to see which positions are best for each phase of the battle. Because rest assured, the opponent is going to be moving either their or your Vivasaurs around to make beating you even easier. Now, you remember earlier when I said all that close range, long range stuff was still around, right? Well, here is where that stuff really starts to matter, as each Vivasaur has a preferred range that they perform the most optimally at. So be sure you're always moving your Vivasaurs to a spot that will make them stronger. Now don't worry about memorizing this kind of stuff, as when it's time to attack, the game will let you know if your Vivasaur is at the best range to hit its target. The star here means it's at perfect range, a circle means the range is okay, but the attack won't hit as hard, and the X means you're out of range. You can still attack, but the damage will be so low it would have been better to just save your FP for later. But it's not just your Vivasaurs that you need to pay attention to, as where the opponent's Vivasaurs are positioned is just as important. For example, let's look at my man Dimitro. He is a mid-range attacker and for the most part he excels at being either in the top two or the bottom two positions, as these are usually where he'll be at perfect range. However, if he has to hit a target that's a lot closer to the back of the support field, Dimitro's perfect range would instead be at the front of the attack zone. This new battle system adds a lot more depth and can be really fun to have you switch up your positions on the fly to either hit the opponent harder or maybe make it so the opponent doesn't hit you as hard. Or, in some specific cases, scramble to get your Vivasaurs back in the right order because the opponent Vivasaur has a move that changes your Vivasaur's positions, or maybe something like an icy battlefield randomizes the positions at the beginning of each turn. Now, I haven't started my playthrough of Frontier at the time of writing, or at the time of recording, but I feel safe in stating that this right here is the best battle system in the series. Things like positioning, typings, ranges, team skills, super evolvers, all mixed together perfectly to make this an interesting and fun battle system, or you can change your strategy on the fly to maximize your team's effectiveness. With this rotating positioning system, you can rotate your Vivasaurs into the best attack position, then end your turn by rotating them the complete opposite way to take the best position for defense. It's really fun and really interesting. I mean, technically the first game had something similar, but the escape zone really made the combat a lot slower and less interesting. This new system takes all the good from the first game and makes it so much fresher and more unique. You won't find a battle system similar to this nowadays. Well, I guess maybe Yokai Watch, but I really don't think I've played enough of Yokai Watch's battle system to really make the comparison. But before we move on, there is a gripe I have with the gameplay that kind of fits into both the Fossil and Vivasaur sections, so I thought I'd save it for after we finish those two. My gripe is that some specific Vivasaurs are a real pain to level up, and the reason was because of their fossils. For example, one Vivasaur for this playthrough I used was Parapu, one of the new Mollusk Vivasaurs. Now, in Fossil Fighters, as you find and clean different body parts of a Vivasaur, you get tons of experience for them as well. And for Vivasaurs with the standard four body parts, this was a great way to help your Vivasaurs gain experience, and in the first game, that was actually how you got more moves. That last part was changed for this game, most likely because of Vivasaurs like Parapu, who only have one fossil. And I think you can guess where I'm going with this. Parapu was quite behind in levels throughout my playthrough because unlike the other Vivasaurs I had, there was no reliable way to level him up to match everyone. Now this wasn't too major of an issue, Champions isn't that difficult of a game, so having a Vivasaur that was a little lower level wasn't that big of a deal for most of the playthrough as long as I strategized accordingly. But it really was a pain to have him be on such unequal footing compared to 3 out of my 5 team members. Oh yeah, and apparently some fossils like Igua are so rare that even with the green mask I wasn't able to find anything other than the head fossil. Even after multiple trips back and forth to and fro to try and get all the fossils to spawn. Now I had tried to come up with a team for myself for this playthrough beforehand to really show off some of the interesting new Vivasaurs. And as soon as I saw Hibagon, I knew he had to be on the team. Just look at this little bastard. 
and since he was only available fairly late in the game, I tried to get all four pieces of Igua, his pre-super form, so I can use him as soon as I revived him, but it was impossible to find the other pieces, as only the head part was available in this game. What the fuck? Where's the rest of you, little guy? Did somebody I read thought it'd be funny to gatekeep my little cartoon kaiju, those sick bastards? Apparently, the only way to gain the other pieces of Igua was through DL fucking C. That bastard from Pokemon Ranger has come to kneecap me once more. But hell, at least the Ranger shit was only really a post-game thing. Except for the random canonical bits. But I digress, at least that stuff was only a post-game venture and didn't affect the main game. What did you do to my baby's coccyx? But if you're familiar with my channel, you maybe already know my, uh, interesting opinions on event limited time DLC. And Fossil Fighters Champions isn't safe from this tirade. It's another example of why I hate this stuff, as there is plenty of really cool content. But I'm not going to talk about it, since I can't reliably play any of it, and I can't guarantee you will either, so we're skipping it. Yeah, I'm aware you can sort of get through exploits, and I even have a pre-owned cartridge with the DLC Vivasaurs on it. But no, I hate that limited time stuff, so no matter how cool it is, I'm not going to talk about it. But I'm also not going to let it really affect my opinion on the game, at least to a point. I guess another way to get Igoa would have been to use the Fossil Cannon. I was going to go over this last time, but sadly I couldn't find a way to fit into the script last time. So instead I decided to move it over to this discussion of this game and it ended up being timely and goes along with the Igoa thing. Basically, the Fossil Cannon is Fossil Fighter's version of online where you're able to shoot fossils over Wi-Fi to a friend, and I even think you can even battle them too. But to be honest, I've never tried any of the Fossil Fighters multiplayer for myself, and even if I wanted to, the DS Wi-Fi has been shut down for years, and it won't be too long before Frontiers has its Wi-Fi shut off as well, though I have heard that the Fossil Fighter community has found a workaround to bring Wi-Fi features back. But yeah, I guess I could have dug up Igawa and Fossil Fighters 1, and then send them over to Champions, except my save file for Fossil Fighters for some reason deleted itself along with the project file for the last video, which completely ruined my plan to make a bunch of presets for the whole series of videos and then re-edit them together for a combined video. I don't know why I told you that other than to just let that little designer in me vent a little bit. But yeah, even if I could trade from the original, that doesn't change the fact that having a fossil for a Vivasaur in the game being locked off in DLC, or if you bought the other game, is just plain dumb and I really, really don't like that. On the bright side, I did get some use out of Lil Hibby and his sick moves in battles, somewhat, but not near enough as I would have if I had a way to get his other fossil parts, and you know, get him to the appropriate level. Also, two of his moves share the same name? I'm not sure why that is. Hibby Howitzer is a dope as hell name though. The two announcers this time around are two guys known as Trip Sarah and Tyranno. Yeah, the announcers this time around are actual talking dinosaurs, that's an interesting change. Trip and Ty are about the same as the announcers last time when it comes to their advice. It's okay, just take it with a grain of salt, but you know, now that I think about it, I'd say they're pretty much the same as the guys last time. Just two fun and cool characters this time around with more unique designs. Though Trip's Sarah might be catching a case if he doesn't quit oogling every female in sight. Tyranno has been trying to hold him back, but it's becoming more and more clear that this is a serious problem. Alright, let's get some music playing in here. If you thought the music was good last time, well, you were right. And it's really good here too. Fossil Fighters Champion soundtrack is so catchy. It's not all memorable, but when you hear even a note of the music, all the memories will flood back. And yes, I guess that is the definition of memorable. But man, this shit is good. If you never place Champions, at least listen to that stellar original soundtrack. And that goes for all three of these games. I like all their soundtracks quite a bit. But if you're not convinced, let me give you some samples of Champions Buffet of Jams. Starting off with the main battle theme, it has this really chill and happy vibe that ironically just kind of makes you ready to fight. I get that that sounds a little weird. Maybe it's just better if I let you listen to it for yourself.
The different city themes are all really fun and relaxing, giving you this cool vibe between searching for fossils. My favorite of the three has to be the Desert Two-Step from Cranial City. It's kind of like the main theme for Champions for me, as it kind of embodies a lot about the game, as it has this really adventure-y and relaxed vibe. Now my all-time favorite theme has to be the main theme for the evil team this time around. So I guess I'll go ahead and put up the spoiler tag here, since the story is right after this anyway. Make sure to skip to the time on screen to avoid all story spoilers for Fossil Fighters Champions. Now for the main theme for the Bare Bones Brigade, it's honestly perfect. It's got this really catchy and cool rock theme, but it also has elements of like a monster movie soundtrack with some of the parts feeling like they jump out at you and scream BOO! And they got a mix of horror and the foot stomping percussion. It's just perfect for the guys who use skeletal dinosaurs to fight. I love everything about this theme. Now let's talk about the story so we can learn more about our spooky opponents. We start by seeing the biggest change added to Champions. You get to pick your character's gender this time! I kinda miss the whole color scheme system from last time, but hey, it's 2010 and girls can be gamers, so, so it's about time Fossil Fighters got with the times. The times being over 10 years ago. Man, I feel old. Now, the canonical names of our two protagonists are Dino and Dinah. Yeah, I know those names kinda suck. I mean, I guess this is the same series with a guy named Diggins, but that one was at least kinda subtle and it was a fun pun. Dino and Dinah just feel like really generic names for this kind of game, you know? Well, whatever one you pick, in my case I pick Dino, we open the game by seeing Dino and his best friend Todd go into some woods to check out a rampaging vivisaur that's attacking anyone near it. Yep, a completely normal thing for children to do. But once the Vivisaur finds them, our little dipshits realize how awful of a plan that was and they make a break for it, only to end up trapped on a cliff's edge waiting for their doom. Till a man on a pterodactyl comes in and tells the two to jump towards him. Todd is scared stiff, but Dino grabs his hand and they jump to their deaths. Nah, I'm just joshing you, buddy. They jump to the P-Terra and they escape the Vivisaur. You know, I say P-Terra, but I guess it's just Terra because the P in Pterodactyl is silent. I really like Fossil Fighters, but I'm not a big fan of how all the names are just these awkward little shortened versions of the dinosaurs' actual names. Some of them work like Spinax, but I don't know, man. Terra for Pterodactyl? It kind of feels like when you're a kid and you're trying to nickname your Pokemon and you can't come up with anything special. Sure, sometimes it works, like naming a Bulbasaur Soar, but like... Do you really want to be the guy with a Charmander named Char? No one wants to be that guy. As they make their landing, the boys get acquainted to their hero, a man by the name of Joe Wild West. A man the boys are all too familiar with as he is the best fossil fighter in the world and our boys are his biggest fans. Joe tells us about the rogue Allosaur and how when a Vivasaur is abandoned by its fighter, its true nature swells up and they become hostile. Not sure about that true nature shit, but Joe says he's here to capture the rogue Vivasaur, something that's never been done in the rest of the series to my knowledge, as you only get Vivasaurs as gifts or through cleaning. Joe decides that this chance encounter may be good experience for the boys and allows Todd the chance to try and battle the rogue Vivasaur with one of his Vivasaurs. Todd wants to take him up on the offer, but he comes down with a stomach ache and lets Dino be the one to battle instead. And after picking one of four starter Vivasaurs, Dino battles and defeats the rogue Vivasaur. And Joe is so impressed he lets Dino keep the starter. Kind of a dick move to not offer Todd one as well, but whatever. Though now I'm curious as to what the laws are around having vivisaurs outside of fossil parks. I mean, they can't just let any 10 year old just run around with a powerful creature at their disposal. Well, actually, every monster taming game lets a child keep a hold of that kind of firepower. 
I guess it all just kind of works itself out. Anyway, cut two years later and our boys are setting out to participate in the Calisteo Cup, a tournament being held by the one and only Joe Wild West, with the prize being the fossil park the tournament is being held in. The boys are given a pair of paleo pagers to keep track of their tournament proceedings. Were pagers still a thing in 2010? But obviously, it's not too much of a tournament with only two people, so of course, like the last game, there's a bunch of fun and interesting people to fight. Including a con man, a princess, and of course, our two other rivals, you know, other than Todd. We have Pauline, a girl with a mask who seems to have some issues with her confidence and she can't even speak to people without her mask and Rupert, an edgy 2006 anime character with a gross fan base to match. Though, as you may have guessed, he is a bit sad on the inside. So as Todd and Dino get ready to take on this tournament, they are informed that their first opponents are... Each other! Yeah, what would usually be your main rival is instead the first guy you beat to move on in the tourney. And, yeah, sorry Todd, but you're beat out in the first round. He seems to not let it get him down, though, as he resolves to support his friend Dino on the sidelines. And going forward, the main plot involves Dino going through and winning his matches in the tournament, including having to face off against and end up helping Rupert and Pauline with their problems. Such as helping Rupert understand the bonds of friendship, and even getting him to rediscover how much he loves being a fossil fighter. Something he was forced to forget so he could become a walking billboard for his dad's company. Though his dad later admits that he acted the way he did because he just didn't want Rupert to taste the sting of defeat. That doesn't make a lick of sense when you consider any of his actions in the story. The game should have just stuck with the whole walking billboard thing. That was way more interesting. Then with Pauline, we learned about her being a very shy person at heart, and the mask she wears is actually a magic one that helps her to become more confident, though maybe a lot more than she intended. And through the help of Dino and friends, she starts to gain more confidence in herself without the mask. Also throughout the game, Dino gets to meet Professor Nigel Scatterly, the foremost expert of the Callisto Island's history, and the curator of the Fossil Parks Museum. Scatterly is a bit scatterbrained though, so usually Dino has to help him find the Callisto Slablets. Tablets that are made of bone that tell the history of an ancient kingdom on the islands that was ruled by someone named Zonga Zonga. And most interestingly, Zonga Zonga actually held fossil battles in his kingdom long before the technology was developed by Diggins and Richmond meaning he had some kind of magical power that brought dead dinosaurs back to life, and he even used them to hold his own fossil fighter tournaments. With the winner of the tournament being declared the strongest, and would be the person that Zonga Zonga would then possess by- Ugh, gross, he shoves his skull into their heads? That is the grossest form of body snatching immortality I have ever heard of, ugh. Though, now that I think about it, I guess we are doing the same thing when we integrate new fossils into a vivasaur. Either way, it's still gross. But at some point in the past, the people rose up against Zonga Zonga, and they sealed him inside a tomb, where he hopefully is still sealed to this day. Anyways, there's a skeleton who just stole the Jumbotron. I hope that has nothing to do with the evil necromancer we were just talking about. Oh. Yeah, it's not a monster taming game without a new villain who's got a bone to pick with our protagonists. And today's team is spooky flavored with the Bare Bones Brigade. Yeah, I'm not sure what makes their bones bare, and if it's an Indu window, then I don't want to know. This time around, instead of trying to take over the park like the three bees last time, this group, led by the evil Don Boneyard and his three boneheaded commanders, are trying to cancel the Callisteo tournament for some mysterious reason. They do this by trying multiple different methods all headed up by the four numbskulls in charge. Whether it was by taking out the power or kidnapping female fighters with a promise of extreme luxury, which they weren't lying about by the way, they did give those girls luxury and service their every need. It was kind of like what happened to Oolong, but less creepy. And they even trapped the fighters in a real jam! Again, there's a comment section if you have complaints. Now the Bare Bones Brigade are probably an overall improvement to the BB Bandits. For one thing, the actual grunts themselves actually get some time to spotlight their funny personalities, unlike the bandits who mostly just acted as fodder, and they kind of made this weird little noise. But I'm kind of mixed on whether or not they're better or worse than the bandit trio. The brigade trio definitely get a lot more screen time apart to really show off their separate character traits and gimmicks. One is a rocker with a jelly obsession. One claims to be a hippie but still fights all the same. And one is a hipster. Wow, that word was probably new in 2010, but now it just sounds so 
old to me. Why does hipster sound old and hippie doesn't? That is... Time is just so weird, isn't it? I like all three of these guys, though, and I like how they're just as effective when they're separated as they are as a unit. The trio last time had a Team Rocket type vibe, and there's nothing wrong with that. But it just made the bandits feel really small, you know? Sure, you had Bulwart and the Grunt Hive Mind, but they were all just really fillery, you get what I mean? It's like when Pokemon brings back Giovanni and some random Rocket Grunts. Those guys are really never developed or fun, they're just kind of stock copy-paste bad guys. The trio this time around feel more like the admin types in Pokemon. I really don't want to use those guys as an example because most of them are kind of lame. But you get what I mean. The new trio kind of just fills out the Bad Bones Brigade and giving the Grunts actual names is just awesome. Yeah, I'm sick of that Grunt A, Grunt B type shit. You know, until a battle starts and then all the Grunts share the same title. But who cares about that when I get to square up with Scotty Bones? Well, at some point in the game, Joe calls Dino, Todd, and Pauline to his office to brand these three the Callisto Patrol, since all three of them have had a hand in stopping the Bare Bones Brigade throughout the game. And eventually, Dino, Pauline, and Rupert, who joins up later, and oh, uh, Todd got ill with a cold during this part of the game, so he actually misses out on quite a bit. Anyway, the other three go to stop the Brigade trio from taking the park's electricity, when suddenly they're swallowed by the Great Bonehemoth, and they seem to be trapped inside the beast. But with the help of a sentient ball named William and his friend Robinson, they learn that they have to defeat the Bonehemus monstrous organ, Lord Tonzilla. We got it! <gasps> but how do we get out? We have to wait until nature calls. Hello? After the escape, the Brigade Trio gives back the park's electricity fossils. Don't ask, everything in this park runs on fossils. The Trio give back the fossils as a way to say thank you for saving them from Bonehemoth. Of course, Don Boneyard isn't really happy that all his attempts to ruin the tournament have been ruined. So he goes to his Plan Z, to sink the fossil park by breaking apart the spinal pillars that hold up the islands. He announces his plan to all the park's fighters and tells them if they want to live, they had better evacuate the island while they still have the chance. Of course, the Callisto Patrol won't let that happen as the kids find a special fossil containing a lot of calcium that can repair the spinal pill- You thought I was joking about this place being ran on fossils, didn't you? Yeah, no, I was very serious. The patrol gets their hands on the calcium and they split off to take on the brigade and fix the pillars. When they report back to Joe, he tells them that he now has the location of the Bad Bones base and the patrol heads off to take on the Dawn. After making his way through the base, Dino finally challenges the Dawn, though before they get into it, the Dawn seems to recognize Dino from somewhere. And after beating him, he tells Dino not to trust Joe Wild West, and then he makes his escape. After getting back to the park, it's time for the finals of the cup, and the last battle is between Dino and Rupert. Oh, I guess I lost. So, does that mean Rupert is the champion? Nah, of course not, though I would like to see a game with a tournament setting one day that takes the wins and especially the losses into account into how the story progresses. But that also sounds like a humongous pain in the ass to write and develop, so how about we just run it back? After beating Rupert, Dino is invited to Joe's office to talk, and Todd decides to tag along since earlier in the game when Todd tries to talk to Joe about the incident at the beginning of the game with the rogue Vivisaur, but Joe didn't really seem to remember anything about it, so Todd reasons that he must have just remembered and that's why he invited Dino up to see him. Todd? Buddy, if that was the reason, why didn't he invite you? The boys head up to Joe's office, and at first Joe is surprised to see Todd, but says it won't interfere with his plans anyway. So he traps the boys in his office and reveals his scheme. We find out that the man before us isn't the real Joe Wild West. Some years back, Joe Wild West found a stone pyramid that contained a coffin that sealed Zonga Zonga inside. And as soon as he opened the coffin, Zonga Zonga took control of Joe Wild West. But he felt that Joe's body was too old, so he decided to host a tournament to find the strongest body around once again for him to inhabit. And that tournament was the Callisto Cup Dino just won. I can just imagine Rupert downstairs going, yeah, that's what you get for running it back, asshole. But before Zonga Zonga could insert his bony skull into the boy's body, I could have wrote that a hundred different ways better than whatever the fuck that was. 
a hole is blown into the side of the building. And in a similar situation as to what happened in the beginning plays out, with Dino grabbing Todd and escaping a dangerous situation by jumping towards a bony pterodactyl. Oh man, I wonder who owns that. Of course, by this point, it's pretty obvious what's going on. The process of Zonga Zonga's body snatching leaves the victim's skull outside of the body, and it turns out that skull has sentience and is able to hop around. So somehow, after Joe was forced out of his own body, he made or he forced somebody to make a robot body for his skull, which he then used to create his Don Boneyard persona. Then using his new body and all the bony sores he found in the stone pyramid, he formed the Bare Bones Brigade to put a stop to Zonga Zonga's tournament to prevent him from finding a stronger body to inhabit. But of course, as we already know, Zonga Zonga founded the Callisto Patrol to combat the Brigade, leaving Joe's plane in the dirt for the moment. However, now that Dino and Todd are informed on the situation, they decide to help Joe get his body back and seal Zonga Zonga away again. To do this, they're going to need to get the help of Scatterly, who's the only one who can find a way to stop Zonga Zonga. Though that's not as easy as it sounds, as Zonga Zonga in Joe's body announces to the islands that Dino cheated in the tournament, and now the whole park is after him, including the three staff leaders. Those guys are literally worthless. And I would have started swinging if they started talking like this to me. Oh, I'm so sorry to disappoint Mr. I won't go into a volcano because it's too hot, so I'll send some kids to do it instead. And then he shows up at the volcano anyway after all the work is done. Kent, you're a lucky bastard that you're a fictional character. Because if you weren't, it'd be on sight, man. On sight! I hate that guy. But before the angry mob could attempt to take out Dino Scatterly, oh, and I guess Pauline and Rupert are here now too, Todd comes in, and as the Chad he is, he takes on the mob of people. You know, we probably could have just KO'd all these guys in like two seconds. Hey, I'm kind of having a moment here. I mean, Pauline and Rupert really don't do anything for the next little bit. They really could just stay here and fight with you. Dude! Okay, okay, just saying. Dino makes it back to the base with Scatterly, and I guess Rupert and Pauline are here too for some reason, where they and Joe make a plan for Dino and Scatterly to conduct a potentially racist plan to put on masks based on Tyranno, and then sneak over to the Stone Pyramid. While I guess Pauline and Rupert just watch a movie or something? I don't know, you two really should have stayed and helped Todd, or maybe try to convince the townspeople or something, you just don't do anything right now. As Dino and Scatterly leave, Joe hops inside Dino's pocket so he can go alongside them. Dino's pockets must be like a black hole to hold fossils, Dino Meadows tools, and now a human skull inside of them. The three of them make their way to the pyramid that really should have been in the desert. I know they're going for a more South American pyramid thing, but that desert is literally just a room with sand in it. It needed something, man. But the three of them make it into the pyramid where they have to face a trial, I mean Dino has to face a trial, to see if he's worthy to hold the mythical rubber hammer that shoots a skull out of a person's head, that is so gross! Now that we have the ultimate weapon, the gang teams up and storms Joe's building, prepared to knock the skull out of Zonga Zonga- I'm sorry, that's just such a gross way to handle the body switching thing. I like it, it just kinda bothers me, which I'm pretty sure it's supposed to, so I guess it's alright. It's still kinda gross. On the way up, Dino has to fight a possessed Todd, and after being snapped out of it, the two boys head up to face Zonga Zonga together, with the mythical rubber hammer in tow. Shit. Well, Todd goes after the hammer by scaling down the outside of the building, while Dino holds Zonga Zonga off. After beating Zonga Zonga, can I, can I just say ZZ for short? I, I'm just gonna say ZZ for short, because saying Zonga Zonga this many times is really starting to mix it up in my brain. So ZZ is about to take Dino's body, but Todd climbs back up and throws the hammer to Dino, allowing him to literally give ZZ an out-of-body experience. With ZZ defeated and Joe getting his body back, the crew tries to grab ZZ, but he slips out of everyone's grasp, with Rupert going into the elevator to catch him... by himself. Yeah, I know you can see where this is going, but I'm gonna act surprised later anyway. The gang catches up to Rupert, who says he's got the skull stashed away, and they head off to the pyramid to seal away ZZ. But not before Rupert has a nice little ominous laugh to himself. You know, just e-boy things. When everybody gathers at the pyramid, they notice that Rupert is missing, and then ZZ reveals himself to have taken over Rupert's body. Whoa, I didn't see that coming! Whoa! And since Rupert and Dino are on the same or similar level of power, ZZ decides that he has all he needs to start his world domination scheme, and raises another pyramid out of the sea to act like his flying fortress. 
Joe tries to send the staff leaders up there on the pterodactyl, but as usual, those morons fail, and sadly, Kent survives. For now. But now the plan is to use the fossil cannon to shoot somebody at Mach 4 towards the Flying Fortress, and take a wild guess who's chosen for that job. So Dino and Rupert's sentient skull are sent hurtling towards the fortress. The two approach Zizi, who is now using his most powerful undead monsters, the Zombie Sores. And after beating them, Zizi has really had enough of this dumbass grade schooler wrecking his plans. So he reveals his final form. A death god dinosaur with unlimited life altering powers, except for when it comes to his own demise apparently. As after knocking him out of his final form, he literally shatters into dust because he can't wrap his thick skull around friendship. Cool. Dino and Rupert then make their escape from the crumbling fortress thanks to the help of Todd on the pterodactyl. You slackers just didn't try hard enough, did you? We are then treated to a scene of Joe Wild West, congratulating Dino for all his accomplishments. Yeah, Dino's accomplishments, assholes. And then Joe tries to hand over the park to Dino as that was the original award for the tournament. Dino declines the offer, however, since, you know, giving a 10-year-old ownership of a country is a really dumb idea, Joe. And, you know, Joe Wild West was the reason that Hunter and Todd are where they are today, so him giving them the island just didn't feel right to them. And also, because they're 10 years old. The game ends with a bonfire between our heroes, as they talk about their time here at the park, and of course thanking Dino for helping them all to be brave. Before then mentioning that they're going to try to one-up each other in the next upcoming tournament the Callisto Super Cup, which will take up the majority of the postgame. And that's the story of Fossil Fighters Champions. And honestly, it's probably better than the first game, at least in a few ways. I'm pretty mixed on which story is overall better, because the majority of Champions is really cool and interesting, but I don't think it ever really reaches how cool the concept of the Dinarians were. I'm not saying I just want the same plot over again, in fact, when it comes to the early to mid sections of the game, I think Champions blows Fossil Fighters out of the water. Fossil Fighters plot had a lot of characters that just have a problem that you fix and you never really see that character again. In Champions, every little story quest has to do with either developing the main cast or setting up plot points for later. That's not to say I don't like having side characters that do their thing and then leave. You've got to know at this point how much I love Nick Nack. It just felt like Champions was more tightly written. Things like multiple character arcs going on in our main cast and having the villain group feeling ironically more fleshed out is pretty cool. And I like that the admins joined up with the brigade because, you know, they were outcasts and they felt like they had a home with Don Boneyard. And in the end, when Joe admits to them that he was lying about being Don Boneyard, they still stay loyal to him and they hang around him because, you know, he was the first person to accept them for who they are. Even if he was kind of a dick to them as Don Boneyard, yeah, I do have a pretty big gripe about the whole twist with ZZ and Joe. I just don't buy it. Like, sure, there's nothing in the story to really say that the twist couldn't happen, but the few interactions with Zonga Joe and Don Wild West don't really sell the whole body swap thing. Like, we never have a moment where the game gives us a hint to what's going on other than that one moment where Don recognizes Dino and Zonga Joe just doesn't. Other than that, Zonga Joe may as well have just been Joe Wild West and Don Boneyard his own character. I really wish we had a moment or two with Zonga Joe where he just slips up once or twice. Maybe after he hears about the brigade causing an issue that threatens the tournament and he just gets so annoyed and angry about it, he just loses the accent and gets his normal text box back before quickly catching himself and apologizing. Or maybe Dawn can have a moment where the admins expect him to lash out and he slips up and feels sorry for them, and tries to be nice to them bringing back his normal accent too. That's something I really wish they played with more in the story, the accents, as both Dawn and Zongajo are using different accents than their usual ones, and that's normally how characters in the story catch on that something is off. The accent or a character's body language is the first thing to go when a disguised character is upset. Because whether something makes you mad or sad, that thing is what your brain will focus on and it's really hard to hide your true feelings when intense or powerful emotions swell up in you. And it was weird that nothing like that happened in the game. Or maybe instead you could have had Joe have his normal accent, but when you get to the islands you notice he doesn't have it anymore. 
and maybe you can have a moment where your character and Todd call him out on it, and Zonga Joe just says that's only for marketing or something. And then you can have that nugget in the player's brain, wondering if it's really just for show. And if it is, why did Joe have it when he saved us back then and there was no cameras around? And then this little nugget gets even more interesting when Don Boneyard reveals himself and he has the same exact accent Joe used to have. I know this kind of thing would have made it more obvious that Joe is Zonga Zonga, but the idea of a body snatching necromancer is revealed to the player very early on, so I'd say most would have already figured that he'd make an appearance in the game somewhere, especially since they did that exact same thing with the Ganache last time. And how on earth do you have somebody like Joe Wild West with a thick and unique accent from the rest of the cast in your story, and you don't use that for your body snatcher plotline? That's so obvious and was handed to the writers on a silver platter. Zonga Zonga has been sealed in a stone tomb for over a thousand years, and when he finally escapes, he gets trapped inside of a body that he feels is old and weak, with nobody else around him that he feels is worthy for his power. So he, after waiting a thousand or so years, needs to wait at least two more to set up a whole tournament that has contestants from all over the world. And when his plan is finally starting to bear some fruit, some bare bones bozos start messing everything up. Now I'm not a death god dinosaur necromancer, but if I was, I'd be so pissed off. Zonga Zonga should be ready to snap at the drop of a hat. There's no way he's keeping it together the whole game, especially when he realizes that Don Boneyard is Joe. You know that had to be his first thought as soon as he saw him on the Jumbotron. I mean sure, they do get their normal accents back after the reveal, but that's just way too late. You could have at least let Joe drop the accent after he recognizes Dino or something, that would have made perfect sense to drop it right there. And here's the thing I really don't buy about this game's plot. Don Boneyard is not Joe Wild West. And I don't mean that's his persona or something, I mean these two can't be the same people. I can expect somebody like Zonga Zonga to lie, use people, and even threaten people's lives, but I cannot expect the same thing from Joe Wild West, the pinnacle of what a fossil fighter should be. He's brave, strong, righteous, kind-hearted. I could see him saying screw trying to convince people I'm the real Wild West, you know, that probably won't work since he looks like a bubble from Zelda. Yeah, bubble, I have no idea why it's called that either. So, he hires a bunch of people and makes an evil gang to scare people away from Zonga Zonga's grasp. I can buy that. What I don't buy is Joe Wild West just shit-talking his subordinates that supposedly he saved from the cruelty of the rest of the world, and oh, I don't know, maybe the fact that he almost killed a shit ton of people by sinking three whole islands? Dude, what the hell was that about? I mean, sure, he did try to warn people to evacuate the island, but we never saw anyone actually evacuate. There's still tons of people around when Dino and friends head down to stop Joe, who, by the way, is halfway into caving in the damn place. And even if people had evacuated and the island sank, guess what? Zonga Zonga would have been the first person on the copter out of there, and he would have just set up another tournament somewhere else. This plan of yours only threatens innocent people living on the inhabited islands you were about to sink. And this isn't even your plan Z or anything, this was like the fourth thing you tried. Like, maybe you could have had him do a kidnap plot with Scatterly where he tries to butter him up to get Zonga Zonga's weakness. Or maybe explain the situation to Scatterly, but nah, I guess Joe forgot about the professor whose museum is right beside his house. And Joe is pretty much just let off the hook for all this. I mean, he apologizes and all that, but that plan would have put thousands of people in danger. Joe Wild West is an asshole! These two issues are probably the only things holding me back from saying Champion Story is amazing. It's definitely good and it definitely blows the original out of the water in a few ways, but I think when it comes to the big twist, it just kind of falls flat. There wasn't enough here to really make it feel like an amazing twist. And you know, I'm not going to sit here and say Bullwart was a better twist villain, that guy just sucked. But the twist with Zonga Zonga when compared to all the twists and turns with the Dinarians? It's really hard to say that Zonga Zonga was better when the Dinarian stuff was all around really interesting and it really added to the story when you replay it, and you get to see new aspects of it in a new light. 
Like, there's no moment in Champions that was as cool as figuring out the sandal fossils were the same sandals that Diggins lost in the past in the first game. There's nothing like that because they never let Zonga Zonga or Joe slip up, even in a subtle way, other than that one little moment each. It's like a mystery where the author doesn't want the audience to catch on easily, so they make the hints too well hidden, or just not have them at all until it's time for the twist. That's a really boring thing to do in a story, especially when your way of doing it is by making the twist characters pretty much be completely different characters the whole game without even a hint of who they truly could be. Those two little moments just weren't good enough. But the quality of Champion's story isn't entirely reliant on the twist. Like I said, the whole thing is more tightly written and that lets the story have a theme. And that theme is to face your fears. Everybody in Champions is afraid of something. Pauline is afraid to speak without her mask. Rupert is afraid of telling his father his true feelings. Joe is afraid not only of Zonga Zonga ruining the world, but also the idea that Zonga Zonga is right about him being too old and too weak. Todd's afraid of everything, and hell, even the dog is afraid of being itself. And it's only through our player characters' actions that any of these issues are resolved. Teaching the other characters to be brave not only for themselves, but also the ones that are around them. And I can't think of a better example of this than Todd. Holy shit have I been dying to talk about Todd, as he is absolutely the best character in the game. Todd starts off as the usual best friend character who conveniently has a stomach ache every time there's a problem going on. But if we're being honest, Todd is a much better character than I remember him being. Like I said, he plays the role of the best friend character, but he has this real smart aleck attitude to anyone who isn't Dino, and when they let him, he'll roast somebody alive. He shit talks like nobody else, and it is so funny sometimes. But as even he admits, he's too scared to back it up, and I don't blame him for being such a scaredy cat. Todd's problem is that he's a normal kid in a world full of shonen protagonists. Of course Todd is scared when a bunch of criminals show up wielding the undead. Most kids his age are afraid of broccoli, much less the fossil mafia. But Todd isn't a stagnant character. He looks up to Dino, Pauline, and Rupert. And after Dino helps them overcome their fears, Todd eventually learns to overcome his own, standing up for his friends in a memorable moment where he sacrifices himself to an angry mob to give his friends a chance to escape, even telling all those angry people to come at him. That's so cool. And he gets another moment later on, because after he's free from Zonga Zonga's control, he helps Dino take on Zonga Zonga, but then the hammer is knocked away. So Todd bravely scales down the building, and then right before Dino's body is taken over, Todd makes it back up and screams something similar to like, I'm not the strongest fighter, but I'm one hell of a climber, and he throws the hammer to Dino. That's also really cool. Watching Todd grow up and become brave and confident was amazing. But we find out something else about Todd. After you free him from Zonga Zonga's control, Todd admits that he was jealous of Dino the whole time, and he was trying his best to hide it. Which, yeah, of course Todd would be jealous. He's a normal kid whose best friend is Goku. Imagine you're watching your best friend doing all the cool stuff that you wanted to do becoming a champion, beating bad guys, and making friends with all kinds of cool people. Of course this would eat Todd up inside. This would be hard for anybody, but for a kid, this is 20 times harder. Because if Dino is Goku, then Todd wouldn't be Yamcha, Tien, Krillin, Roshi, Piccolo, Bulma, Vegeta, or Oolong. He'd be Chaozu, somebody who honestly doesn't do anything outside of his first appearance except sacrifice himself, shit talk somebody, and most importantly, stays in the background. There's a point in the game where Todd is actually sick for once, and he's taken out of the action for quite a while. And during said time, Dino, Pauline, and Rupert have a bonfire together, where they discuss things like the tournament, the bad guys, and all this stuff that Todd, on some level, really wished he could be a part of. And the whole time this cutscene was playing, I'm like, poor Todd. He is up sick somewhere, and nobody, including his best friends, are even talking about him. Like, you know, if he heard that Dino is having a campfire with his new friends talking about their new adventures without him, that would utterly crush him. So I totally love this idea that he was trying to be a good friend and hide how jealous he was, 
but then Zonga Zonga used all those emotions to control him against Dino. Man, I loved Rosie last time, but there is no competition. Todd is just a much better friend character. Rosie was funny, but there wasn't a lot of depth to her. Todd isn't as funny as Rosie was, but he's a much more well-rounded character, and I think he's a good example of not just the theme of champions, but also of how well the story is written. Say for some issues. Also, whoever decided to make the villains of a game about facing your fears, a bunch of undead dinosaurs being headed up by a necromancing skull, with a demon dinosaur form, needs a fucking raise, my man. I mean, a necromancer is already a cool villain idea for the series that's whole thing is raising things from the dead. That is some stupid fun irony, by the way. But that, plus the theme, plus some of the music having a monster movie vibe, that is completely and utterly genius. I love that. The post game for Champions has some similarity to the last game, mostly in terms of the rematches and the legendary hunts, which includes what has to be my favorite post game legendary hunt like ever. So to get Zonga Zonga and his zombie dinosaurs, you pretty much have to go back to his flying fortress, where Joe has apparently set up an attraction where people can pay to beat the unliving shit out of Zonga Zonga's corpse. That is hilarious. But the main thing going on in the post game is the Callistio Super Cup, like I mentioned before. But what I didn't mention before was that Rosie actually comes back for the post game tournament. I mean, she's not the only character that comes back as the Digga Dig Chief shows up earlier in the game to help take the mask off of Pauline when it kind of possesses her for a while, long story there. And the Dinarians are in the DLC, but yeah, Rosie comes back and claims that she is the new champion of Vivasaur Island. And she's kind of a bitch now. I don't know if it was Hunter picking Duna over you, Todd being a more developed character than you, or maybe you were in space without a helmet on or something, but Rosie is really rude for no reason, and what's with this champion shit? Vivisaur Island has ranks, but there wasn't anything about champions and how their league was structured. And hey, while we're talking about the first game, where the hell are all the Dinarians? I mean, we saw Dinarians start to intermingle with human society as soon as the credits of the last game, and now they're just nowhere to be seen outside of DLC? Like, how cool would it have been to have a Dinarian as a rival or something? I mean, they are a race of people who can turn into dinosaurs. You can't tell me there wasn't a single one of them that wasn't at least partially interested in becoming a fossil fighter and then entering this big tournament. We spent so long trying to give those guys a home and they don't appear in the sequel? What's with that? Oh, uh, it's about time to prank the spoiler-free people. <clears throat> and that, my friends, is how Abraham Lincoln full Nelson Genghis Khan into the Gigantosaurus's mouth on the planet Zed. Oh, uh, spoiler-free people are back. Uh, don't worry, that last sentence didn't have anything to do with the spoilers we were just talking about for, like, an hour or so. Or was it? You won't know till you play the game. And what a damn fine game it is. Fossil Fighters Champions is pretty close to a perfect sequel, save for a few issues, but the majority of it is fantastic. If you haven't played this game, man, you're just straight up missing out. Fossil Fighters Champions has some of the funnest gameplay you'll find in a monster taming game. Its music is fantastic, sure the storyline has a few bumps along the way, but overall it's very well written. And for the DS in 2010, I'd say this game looks really good. Champions, in a word, is just pure amazement. Oh boy, this one is gonna be fun. It's been four years since the release of the incredible Fossil Fighters Champions, and I'm sure that the anticipation for the next game was probably unbearable for the few Fossil Fighters fans out there. I actually wasn't one at this time, as the game we're talking about today was actually my first foray into this series. And of course that game was... Fossil Fighters Frontier. Adventures right around the bend, and the world's got wonders to spare. 
Prehistore, go and restore, friend. Go out there, go if you dare. If you dig it up, you'll see. There was power all that time. Wonder is and Roto Devonators will see. Hit the road of Vivasaur, it's your moment to shine. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Bring the past alive if you got the drive. Buckle up and face in the fossil frontier. Pedal to the floor, make the engine roar. Put it in the primal extinctual gear. Pedal to the ground, discoveries are found. Hammer drills real while the millions await. Put it through your heart, powers off the charts. Put it in a, da, da, da. What the fuck does song go? Grab your chance, the future's your own. Don't let the present imprison your dreams. Make your life in the wild unknown. Go and be free. If it's just right around the bend. And the world's got wonders to spare. Prehistoric, go and reform. Re I really have no idea what he's saying. Go if you dare. Give you dig it up. You'll see. There was power all that time. Wondrous is under the blah 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 blah. Hit the road and bib so it's your moment to shine! Oh wow, that's really difficult. Singers, that's a hard profession. Yeah, that did just happen. Was probably what all the fans first thought as soon as they saw the trailer for Frontier. And they were most likely disappointed. I can't blame them, really. A lot of Frontier is either controversial or just garbage. Most of the team behind the first two games weren't around for this project, so although Red still has a credit in the development of this game, it was actually Spike Chunsoft that was primarily behind this new game, and they made a lot of changes. Now, as I said, I started with Frontier, and then I went back to the other two. In fact, I actually ended up playing them in reverse order. Back then, I actually enjoyed Frontier quite a bit. Sure, it had some issues, but ultimately, it was a fairly fun game. And I think it was my first monster taming game outside of Pokemon that I ever really got into. Then, after I played the other two, my opinion didn't really sour on Frontier, but I definitely understand why so many feel the way they do about it. Now, I don't do number scores, as I feel there are not really all that great of a way to really determine the quality of a game, and they can be easily misinterpreted. But if I did, I'd say that Frontier is a solid 5 out of 10. It's not the worst thing ever, but it's not really going to rock anybody away like the original or Champions. Though, if you're willing to dig through the midness of it all, I think you'd find that Frontier actually does have some positives that I think are an improvement to the series. Not a lot of positives, but positives all the same. Probably would be better to explain than to just keep up this weird, vague prologue, so how about we just get into it? Starting off with the visuals for what is the last time for this retrospective. They are quite the step up, as they should be being a more powerful hardware. But genuinely, I think this game looks really good. All of the locations are colorful and they all have these cool landmarks so you always know which area of the map you're in. Which is very useful for the more open areas you travel through. Whether it be a large central pillar, a giant dump truck, or a dino version of Mount Rushmore. But the world itself isn't just colorful, the textures are very well detailed. All the animation work is all, you know, fine enough. You got the normal walk cycles and reaction shots for the characters. Though now most of the emoting comes from the portraits of the characters that pop on the screen. Now this is actually a fairly common technique in the games industry, and I think it works well here in Fossil Fighters, as this type of cutscene is usually done to help give more emotion to a scene in a game where... the character models just can't do that. I think the way it's handled in the last two games was completely fine, and the characters do still do little emotes in the overworld, Nothing like spinning and falling, but with these more detailed models, that might have been a little too cartoonish. I say knowing full well the fat kid rolls. Another reason for the portraits probably has to do with the fact that the characters spend a lot of time in their cars during this adventure. That must sound strange to some of you, but don't worry, I'll cover it later. The portraits are a good compromise, as the characters can still show emotion and react to things while still being inside their vehicles. 
The Vivasaur attack animations are all as fun as they were last time with some squash and some stretch, and of course all the cool super moves. Plus they even walk up and attack each other like in Colosseum or Battle Revolution, which is really cool. The Vivasaurs themselves are nicely detailed, I like how we got individual scales and hairs on them now. It's a nice jump in quality for the series, and I think that some of the new designs are actually pretty interesting and pretty cool. Except, I don't know why we had to put down the old designs to have them. Like, what was the thought process here? I won't lie, some of the new redesigns, you know, I actually enjoy them quite a bit more than the originals. But, is that worth getting rid of all the original designs that the fans had loved for so long? No! Of course it wasn't! And what's so baffling to me is that they could have had both designs and just called them regional variations. They already did that with half of the Vivasaurs. Oh, wait, did you think that design changes were the biggest problems with the Vivasaurs in this game? Oh, buddy, you better strap in! As this game is actually the first of the series to cut out most of the roster of Vivasaurs. Now, in all fairness, Champions did technically do this first as it actually cut out the first game's final boss Vivasaurs from its roster. However, in exchange, we got around 100 new Vivasaurs, bringing us to a total of 174 unique Vivasaurs for that game. Frontier only has 90, which wouldn't be a huge issue if it wasn't for the fact that some of that 90 are recolored versions of other Vivasaurs. Oh, you don't like Ankylo? Well, how about you try his cousin who doesn't wash his ass? Now, Vivasaur sharing base models and animations was a thing since the first game. I'm cool with that. However, each of those Vivasaurs got unique looks and personalities that weren't smelly ass recolors. Why would you do this? And what's worse is that the roster is technically smaller than 90, because there are three, technically four whole boss Vivasaurs completely unavailable to the player. And there are also three Vivasaurs that you do own, but lose throughout the story. What's with that? Who decided to not only give us a smaller roster than the first two games, but also fill said roster with a bunch of recolors and Vivasaurs you can't use? Look at Beckles. He's a cool design, but he's the only one here who doesn't keep his original name. Why? Because even the creators knew that there was no way in hell they could ever get away with calling this thing Spinex. Oh, and did I mention the lack of variety in the models? There's no prehistoric mammals or mollusks or snakes or turtles or anything like that. I'd ask why, but I know the answer is probably money or time or something. And man, if you played this game in Japan, I feel sorry for you because you missed out on 10 extra Vivasaurs added to the international release. Moving on to gameplay, because I need to conserve some of my sanity for the rest of this video. Here we see a lot more controversial changes. My favorite. Well, uh, actually, yes, some of it is. Let's start with the big one, Bone Buggies. I have seen lots and lots of people hating on these things, and honestly, I don't agree at all. In fact, I think they're an amazing addition to the franchise. Hey, 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 wait, wait, don't click off. Just please allow me a chance to explain myself. So in the previous games, your fossil hunting mostly came down to you walking around an area, digging up fossils, walking back and then cleaning and selling all you dug up, and then going back and doing it all again with a battle every once in a while. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, but when you compare it to what you do in Frontier, I just don't want the series to go back. In Frontier, you get a bone buggy, basically a supercar that lets you drive around a fairly open area. But that's not all. You can also use it to jump across gaps, break rocks, or even drive away or towards rogue vivasaurs that even interact with each other and the player. It's honestly a really fun and fresh experience compared to other monster taming games. It's fun to race around the rogue Vivasaurs trying not to get caught. It's fun doing the challenge routes where you race against a Vivasaur before it can eat a rare fossil of itself. I'm not really sure why it does that, but it's really fun. And I like speeding towards a ramp and flying over a T-Rex's head. Cars and dinosaurs have always had a unique connection in pop culture. And the buggies add a unique part to the gameplay as the player not only has to get good at driving around in the buggy, 
but they also had to make sure that they had the right one for the job, as each of the different buggies available are better or worse at certain things. Some are really fast, but they can't hold as much weight. Some are huge and can crush boulders in a single hit, but, you know, they're way slower to compensate. You personalize each vehicle to your liking so it matches your preferred playstyle. Which, sure, it does take a lot of in-game money, but hey, that's no issue because most of the lame upgrades from the last two games are gone. Why, you ask? Well, I'll gladly tell you, as the cleaning and the reviving of Vivasaurs has never been this easy as all of that is in the buggy. And what does that mean? Well, my little friend, that means that there is no more having to worry about how many fossils your little void pockets can hold, as the bone buggy will just allow you to not just clean that bad boy, but also lets you revive that sucker right then and there. Meaning you can use a vivisaur as soon as you find it. No more having to run back and forth to and fro from town and then back to my personal pit of hell. It even goes ahead and sells off any jewels or fossils you can't use as soon as you clean them. So there's no more having to worry about messing up and getting a lower score, cause you're making money no matter what. Plus, no more donation point only fossils, which low key were just a huge pain to grind up. But wait, there's more! As now, due to hindsight being particularly 2020 in this department, the game actually allows you to revive a vivisaur with any fossil. That's right, baby, you don't need the head fossil anymore. Which, yeah, I never understood why you needed a specific fossil part to revive a vivisaur. I mean, even if you revive a brain, it still needs the rest to function. Like, that can't be how reviving works, right? Right? But yes, the bone buggies are not just a fresh means of exploration, as they also streamline some of the more time-consuming elements from the first two games and in their place, they're replaced with a much more interesting upgrade system. It is really fun to upgrade individual parts of your bone buggy as you move along in the game, giving you a real sense of accomplishment as each of those upgrades are felt as soon as you put your pedal to the metal, as each upgrade either makes the bone buggy faster or easier to handle or it allows you to carry more equipment to hunt fossils. I mean, honestly, everything with a bone buggy just sounds so cool and creative, doesn't it? You must be thinking to yourself, man, this is just too good to be true. Well, my little friend, that's because it is, or it is in one or two senses. Though neither is directly caused by the bone buggy itself, they are related by proximity to the buggy, and I think they might be why the buggy is disliked as it is. Essentially, the two main gameplay elements of Fossil Fighters that made the series as interesting as it was, were completely gutted by Frontier. I hope you got your fill on positivity, because we just burned through most of it in those first two sections. Let's start with cleaning the fossils. From a glance, it's pretty much the same as it's always been. Scan the fossil to see which parts need cleaning, then you use the hammer to smash away the tough stuff, and then finally use the drill for more precise cleaning, as you try to get the best score possible under a time limit. Except this time, you don't have to worry about damaging a fossil beyond repair. As soon as you get it to 50%, you can just hammer away at it. Wait, how's that different from the first two games, you're probably wondering. Well, in those two games, you could still do enough damage to a fossil to totally wreck it beyond revival, even if you already cleaned 50% of it. In this one, you can't, as that blue bar will refuse to go down no matter what. So at some point, I just decided to bring only a hammer, because smashing away with the strongest hammer was all that mattered. Which sucks, because Frontier tried to add some more depth to this aspect of the gameplay. You see, Bone Buggies let you upgrade your hammer and drill multiple times throughout the game to help you deal with tougher and tougher rocks. Which is a good change compared to the Hyper Hammer and the Super Drill in the first two games. Which were just never worth the money since the basic drill and hammer you get at the start just... You know, worked fine throughout the whole game. Plus, all the buggies allow you to customize which cleaning equipment you can use. So if you want a small and a medium drill, you can do that. Or maybe you can buy a bigger buggy and carry three types of hammers. Not sure why you'd do that, but you can if you want. So this game adds a lot of depth to what you can use to clean a fossil. But the actual cleaning itself is so... <sighs> Bare bones that it doesn't matter. You just get the strongest hammer and you're set. 
I better hear some groans in the comment for that bare bones joke. I didn't even mean to make it. I'm just naturally that unfunny. When it comes to the fossils themselves, there's only two types in this game. Normal sized fossils and the big ones with the whole skeletons inside. Which, you know, is perfectly passable, especially when you consider the new fossil rock system that gets stronger and stronger throughout the game. But I kind of wish we had maybe a new type of fossil, or maybe they could have brought back the flipping ones again. Uh, this is all perfectly passable, I just... I, I was just kind of hoping for a new one. Consumable items return, and they're pretty mechanically interesting. The time probe does what it does last time and adds more time to the clock. And, you know, while we're on the subject, I guess I should thank the game, as it does finally give us a reason as to why there's a time limit on cleaning. It has something to do with a battery that's located in your bone buggy, which you can upgrade if the normal 60 seconds isn't enough for you. So, sure, why not? I complained about that in the last two games as a bit of a running gag, so I might as well give credit as to where it's due. Thank you, Frontier, for giving us a reason. But now, instead of buster probes being able to scan as to where a weak point is on a fossil, we now got these chisel things instead that actually weaken the rock around the fossil as you drive one or more into a wall. And if you dig them deep enough, they'll actually break off the rock like a buster probe, but it will damage the fossil if you do it this way. It's an interesting balancing act, but like I said, you can't damage a fossil beyond repair as long as you make it to 50%. So go hog wild if you don't care about the score. Though, before we leave this, I do like how we are actually cleaning the fossil inside the rock face. You know, instead of doing it on an operating table. I feel this way is just more interesting, and it kind of reminds me about how fossils are cleaned on real dig sites. I think it's pretty neat, and letting you look at all the fossils and their full skeletons in the 3D space is pretty interesting. Hey, look, there's more positives in here than I thought. I say knowing full well what's next. So, battles in the previous games were very unique compared to their contemporaries and even most monster taming games today. It followed this structure of individual zones that different vivisaurs made use of in different ways. You could bring five vivisaurs into a battle and then three of those five would be the ones you would actually use and the other two would stay behind and gain experience. There were five types and neutral's little cousin who just tags along. It was simple to get into and fun to get more invested in. It was fantastic. So I don't know why it's this shit now. So let's start off with the pettiest change, the type chart. Now look at this chart. Do you see something off? Yep, legendary is gone, but who cares about that? It was never even a real type. What I'm concerned about is why the fuck you would swap two types in the circle. Uh, sir, we're almost finished with the battle system, and I was hoping you had the chance to look it over- Oh, I looked it over, alright. What the fuck is this? Uh, that? Well, we decided that the legendary type was really complicating the chart for no reason. I mean, Jerry tried to argue that we could do something interesting with it instead. But as usual, I shut his bitch ass down, just like you told me- No! I mean, what the fuck is grass doing being affected by ground types? Oh, uh, the air type's always done the- No! That's grass, and fire beats grass. Kids are gonna be confused because all they know is Pokemon. And Pokemon, grass is fire's bitch! Uh, so instead of this weak crap, how about we swap these two loser types and make it weak to fire? But, but sir, we already kind of matched the Pokemon type chart already. And how is Earth supposed to be super effective towards water? That, that doesn't make any sense. You know who you're starting to sound like. Wait, 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 no, sir, no, Jerry, no! Oh, and where do I even begin with the rest of this shit? All right, so basically they cut out everything that made the combat interesting. There's no team building, no different zones, no ranges. Instead, you pick one out of any of your available vivisaurs and you battle with it. I can already hear some questions. Yes, you aren't blind. There are other vivisaurs on my side of the field, but they're not my vivisaurs. Instead, these are owned by Paleo Pals, NPCs that battle alongside the player. Pretty much, they're vivisaurs you don't own or control in any way during the battle, making this system pretty much a boring chore that you only control a tenth of at any time. 
make sure you have something else going on in the background as you'll pretty much just be watching shit happen for most of the battle. But wait, what are those weird icons that cover up 90% of the cool, interesting action going on? Well, those my friends are support shots. Basically little temporary stat boosts you can shoot at a Vivisaur as one is attacking. They boost your lower attack, defense, accuracy, etc, etc, and they can even heal a Vivisaur. Well, visual overload aside, that sounds like a half-decent mechanic, right? Well, no! Because you can spam these things over and over, and they're broken! So what it comes down to is you're either spamming these things to high heaven, and knocking out your opponent in a single hit, and then making the opponent's attack do such pitiful damage while healing yourself at the same time. Or, both sides are spamming support shots to the point where they just cancel each other out. And at that point, why do we even have them? Then we have stances, which I think are kind of interesting. They're pretty much like ranges in the first two games as different Vivasaurs are better or worse depending on their stance. Which means if your opponent is in a bad stance and you're in a good stance, that combo can do massive damage. And this system also gives flying Vivasaurs a unique attribute, as one of their stances is them flying high in the air where the other Vivasaurs have a hard time reaching them. I think the stances are an okay replacement for ranges as they do technically serve the same function. You know, in a game where you only control one Vivasaur and you can't move that one around at all. Stances are a decent compromise. It's just a shame that they don't mean jack shit. I mean, sure, a good or bad stance can change a battle drastically. Or at least it would if support shots didn't exist to cancel out any negatives of a bad stance. Or just give you all the benefits of a good stance with just the press of a button. I used auto battle so much in this game. There were so many times I just got so damn bored, and I just turned it on and went and did something else. This system is absolute dog shit. It's not just bad, it actively wastes your time. I'm sure you're wondering if there is any possible balancing things in place for this battle system. Like maybe support shots run out, or maybe being stuck with one Vivasaur can lead to a possible problems if fighting something that counters it. Well, you would be sort of right, support shots do actually run out, but I really wish they didn't. I know, a strange thing to say, but when you run out of support shots in a battle and have to drive back to a station to refill them, then you run the chance of having to battle without support shots and god, those are dreadful. They take 10 times longer as the game expects you to have support shots. I know that all sounds a bit hypocritical, but if you ever played this game, you'll know exactly what I mean. And yeah, being stuck with one Vivasaur would be a problem, but you're not stuck with one. You can use any of your other Vivasaurs at any time, so you're never really at a disadvantage. However, one Vivasaur only gets XP after every battle, so trying to train up multiple Vivasaurs is a waste of time. Lord knows I tried to. I even gave them funny nicknames, which I should have done for the first two games, but I couldn't find the nickname guy for whatever reason. Anyway, the game is balanced around you only using one Vivasaur the whole way through. Which again, might sound like a challenge, but support shots make everything a non-issue. So trying to raise other Vivasaurs is just a waste, even if you spend hours grinding like I did. You're better off just using one Vivasaur, and the game pushes you pretty hard towards one anyway, so might as well. I bet you're wondering if any Super Revolvers are in this game. And I bet the answer popped into your head before you can finish asking that question, because no, no they're not here, as that would have been interesting. However, Gold Fossils are still around, but instead of Super Evolving, they act as a secondary moveset for a Vivasaur. As just like the normal fossil parts, each gold part has a move tied to it. That is an interesting concept, I do really like it, it's just nowhere near as interesting as Super Evolvers. There are super moves like I mentioned earlier, but they're tied to this gauge that goes up when you and your Paleo Pals use certain moves. They're pretty powerful, but you don't really have a lot of control over when or who uses the move, since it activates as soon as the bar fills up. The animations are pretty cool though. 
Yeah, pretty much the most interesting part of the gameplay is the buggy, which I like. I like the buggy. I'd love to see it return in the fourth game, but like, that really should not have been where this game peaks. There are some negatives to the buggy, like why are there no races or time trials for the buggy other than the challenge routes? You put cars in a game with decent driving mechanics and you don't do anything car related with them. I mean sure there's two time trials in the story, but those are so damn easy that you can beat them with the slowest car. So like, what's even the point of them, you know? Oh, and by that I mean the time trials, not the buggy. I still really like the buggy, but you know, what's the point of the two time trials? At least this game does DLC the best in the series. They actually use the QR code scanner on the 3DS and they let you scan these little cards so you can get all the content, which is perfect since you can still get all that content nowadays. You just look up a picture online, scan it, and there you go. You get two bone buggies which are pretty overpowered, the UT vivasaurs which are kind of cool but I've never really used them, and some spoiler vivasaurs we'll get into later. Though I do have one complaint. And it would be that those three, technically four, unusable boss vivasaurs should have gotten DLC cards so you could actually have them in the game. That's always been a really fun thing about fossil fighters. I'm not sure why they took that part of the series out for some reason. But otherwise, yeah, the DLC is really cool. Alright, it's time for music, and thankfully, it's all pretty much a bop. Fossil Fighters and Champions have some really amazing soundtracks, and Frontier actually decides to share something from its predecessors with its soundtrack, which carries some of my favorite music in the series. A lot of it has this techno rock feel that really matches with the aesthetic of the game. I mean, there was a reason that Frontier's battle theme was chosen over the other two for representation in Smash Brothers. This theme is hype incarnate with that techno beat overlaying a heavy rocking guitar the whole time that just, just, ah, you better just listen for yourself. Oh, and the boss battle theme. It's pretty much an expansion on the main battle theme, but with this beautiful piano piece at the beginning, and it really ties the whole thing together, and it makes the encounter feel special compared to the other battles in the game. This next one may not be one of my favorites, but I love how the fossil cleaning theme just has this Metroid Prime type feel. Weird comparison, maybe, but the music and the sound effects for the drill and hammer really make me feel like I'm using an advanced piece of tech to clean these fossils with. I don't know what to tell you, man. It just all really works for me. Oh, and of course, the theme song. I know a lot of people think it's cringe, and it even turned a few people off of the game entirely. You guys might have dodged a bullet there. But honestly, I love this stupid theme. It's pretty much exactly what a 2000s anime version of Fossil Fighters would have used as a theme song. And the mix of stupidity and sincerity just pulls the whole thing together for me. And you can tell just how much fun the people behind it had making it. to the fossil frontier pedal to the floor and let the engine roar put it into primal instinctual gear but really what the fuck is a primal extinctual gear that makes no sense and i love it but now we have reached the story section and man oh man i don't even know if i should put a spoiler tag up for this shit it's so basic and predictable but Whatever, I did for the last two, so here's the tag if you don't want to hear spoilers. You're not really missing much. We start off with this guy named Stryker, an agent of Interpol. Yeah, Interpol with fossils. <laughs> Tracking down a mad scientist named Dread Raven. After a vicious beatdown, Dread Raven is forced to surrender. But not before he starts to complain about how close he was to creating the ultimate weapon. 
And that's where that ends. And we skip a few years later where we're told about the Wardens. Basically the fossil police that monitor the different fossil parks around the globe. Or at least just the three we see in the game. On a more positive note, I guess this does answer my question in the last video where I asked who monitored vivasaurs outside of the parks. Or at least I think it does. Anyway, we play as either one of these two playable characters who are well on their way to becoming wardens themselves. Their names are Trya and Jura, named after the Triassic and the Jurassic periods, which are a lot better names than Dino and Dina. Though forgive me if I call Trya Tria during this video, that's just what I've called her in my head ever since I saw the name. Anyway, we're playing as Trya as she's getting ready for her final exams to become a warden. She meets up with a bunch of basic ass characters such as the wacky best friend who isn't funny or your best friend. The nerd boy who knows everything. Haha, <laughs> Roland, get it? He's fat, so he rolls. Girl character. Calling in my skin! Girl with an actual character. And the Australian, who's the only one of these guys that I actually really like, but of course he never appears in the game again. I know he's nothing but a dog shit stereotype, but that's just so much more entertaining than these basic ass bitches. We meet up with Strider who tells us about our final tests which we need to become wardens, which are a driving test and a battle test. The tests all go fine, but at some point this shit stain gets the idea to be a little quirky and bust into a lab and press a bunch of random buttons, dragging Trya along with him. They accidentally release a tiny vivasaur who runs off with our heroes going after it. They end up saving it from a rogue Gorgo, oh right I didn't explain rogue vivasaurs. Basically they're vivasaurs that either ran away from their fighter or the fighter threw them away, and the wardens hunt them down and bring them back to base. Think similarly to the opening to Champions with Joe and the Allosaurus. I actually like that they brought that back for a new game mechanic, that's actually really cool. Anyway, we save the vivasaur but we're busted by Striker. Though we aren't fired as Striker's actually really impressed with our bravery and lets us stick around. Sometime later, Trya actually has to fight off the same rogue vivasaur again, but the rogue ambushes her and wrecks her bone buggy, making it so she can't summon any of her vivasaurs to battle. All seems lost before the little vivasaur actually comes to Trya's aid, escaping its prison once it senses she's in trouble. I like how Striker here doesn't even try to grab the vivasaur even though it's right in front of him. That's how useful he is for the rest of the game. Anyway, the little guy actually transforms into a bigger form to fight off the rogue vivasaur. And after scaring it off, it transforms back, showing that he's not like other vivasaurs. Instead of listening to that crappy techno rock, he prefers the 80s styles of music in his stinky sweatshirt at 3am, wishing he was created in a different era. After being rescued, Tri is actually assigned to work under Striker directly, as everyone else were spread out across the, well, I mean, to two other places, really. Tri also receives the little vivasaur to take care of since they have a special bond, where she then gives the little shit a bandana and a name. You can name it whatever you want, like Crunch, Chomp, or Kyle with an accent E, but canonically it's known as Nibbles. Try and Nibbles are pretty much sent all across the world, basically to do little odd jobs for random people or to help other wardens by telling them to stop being stupid or to do their damn job. I do like this character, however, her and her cronies are pretty funny. You can also do these side missions on this weird missionator thing, but honestly it's not really worth doing since the rewards are easily obtained through other means. Speaking of which, you can actually rank yourself up this time around by doing daily tournaments to upgrade your license so you can rank up. Though these tournaments are structured like absolute dog shit, because they're locked to certain days so you essentially have to grind through the weak ones for each day so you can get to one that's your actual level. Which is stupid and a waste of time, but also this game is pretty much telling us to rank up as an agent of the law. You had to beat the shit out of a bunch of civilians with your warden buddies. I had a joke planned, but honestly, that's just pretty fucked up. And, you know, that's pretty much all you're doing for the first five or six hours, and then the plot starts to happen when Black Raven escapes prison, and Trya is sent out to try and stop his evil schemes. However, she's confronted by his team of criminals, the BR Brigade. BR Brigade? That's literally the last two bad guys' names combined together. That's lazy as hell. Not to mention it breaks the tradition of all the acronyms being triple B's. Wait, B R B was that meant to be like B right back from prison because that's actually kind of funny. Uh, but seriously, what moron names their evil organization after themselves? I mean Black Raven was a known criminal so it kind of works for him but for anybody else it'd be absolutely ridiculous to do this with your actual name and then try to use that same name in your daily life or while you're undercover. 
Hold on a second. Bartholomew Bulwark Bandits, you put your full fucking legal name on it, and then you kept using that name while undercover as the police chief? What is wrong with you? No, why did Richmond even hire you? Did he not do a background check before hiring the head of security for his Jurassic Park bullshit? I, you know what? I believe it. I fully believe that he wouldn't do a background check. Two are definitely going on the shit list alongside Kent. The BR Brigade are pretty uninteresting. The grunts are just the usual hive mind of A and B type grunts, and the admins have one interesting moment each. Otherwise, they're just kind of there. But they're not just a bunch of losers. They're a bunch of losers who use dark energy to create dark vivisaurs. That are totally not just regular ass vivisaurs with their regular ass moves doing regular ass things. Fuck you. After all the hard work put into the bony sores and zombie sores, you come in here with this bullshit? Like you couldn't give less of a damn about this, could you? Only three of these dark vivisaurs are any different from their normal versions. And those three are just a palette swap and a type change. Like you couldn't do that for every one of them? Is that really too hard for you to do? I mean Champions had 11 to 13 unique villain vivisaurs and you couldn't even do a palette swap for like 5 of them? I mean I get what you're going for here, dark vivisaurs are essentially to fossil fighters as shadow pokemon were to XD and Colosseum. However this shit just doesn't work at all, as most of the dark vivisaurs you fight are exactly the same as the normal ones with nothing special that makes them unique. Heck, even Black Raven's main Vivisaur Giganto doesn't even get a color change. In fact, you don't even fight him at all. The dark energy crap is just so boring, and what's worse is when you think about it, you realize that they had the perfect opportunity to just to replace the legendary type with a new dark type. I mean, the color scheme is already there, and you already removed a legendary as a typing. Plus, it would have been interesting to have a fifth type in Fossil Fighter that actually did something instead of just being a recolor. But alas, that didn't happen. At least there's no potentially racist plans this time around. Oh, look, Nibbles can absorb dark energy and change it to other forms. I wonder if that's going to be important. Tria and Co. spend a lot of time and energy hunting down and stopping the brigade, but they end up failing to stop them from stealing the necessary materials that Black Raven needed to create his diabolical scheme of world domination. At first, the characters are stuffed on what to do, however, a mysterious person just gives us the answer and then leaves. Yeah, we'll get to him. We then track down Black Raven where he reveals his true evil scheme. He plans to travel back in time and use dark energy to control all the dinosaurs down to their bones, so that when they're revived by fossil fighters in the present, they're all under his command. Triup, triup, whatever. The girl tries to stop him, but he escapes back in time to the past, leaving everyone in the present worried and trying to formulate a plan to travel back in time and stop him. Though, this all leaves me confused as to why we would do that or anything at all. But, but Chubby, he went back in time. If we don't stop him, our Vivisaurs will turn on us. Yeah, but see, if that's the case, he would have already won. Since as soon as he went through the portal, our world would have changed into this dystopia. But everything's the same, and our Vivisaurs still listen to us. So that means he failed and either never tried another plan again, or he possibly died there. Th that's not how time travel works, and Professor Little here says the changes are slowly but surely happening as we speak. Uh, yeah, that is how time travel works. The series spells out pretty heavily how it all works. The only contradiction is Professor Little's comment, like you said. However, we are never shown any of that shit, so that tells me that maybe we should have somebody chaperone or fact check the little genius who's barely out of diapers. I'll go into this a bit more later, but for now, let's just continue with the story. Since our mysterious friend here led us to Black Raven's cell earlier, we know the formula for time travel and all we need now is the materials. So, we do another round trip across the world and get all the stuff where we fight an overgrown Raja, take part in a legendary face-off between two masked fossil fighters, and go blow for blow with an actual dragon. Why wasn't the villain stuff based around you, man? That would have been awesome. But once the necessary materials are collected, we are shot back in time with our pal Strider in t What do you mean he's too valuable for this mission? You said yourself, little, we got one shot at this. This is the exact time to send out your heaviest hitter, but of course it's left up to Triad Nibbles to face the bad guys. 
Our heroes are sent back to the ancient past, and I'll be real, it's honestly really cool to see all this ancient world stuff. And it's really fun to battle actual dinosaurs before the revival process turns them into vivisaurs and gives them all their elemental powers. I seriously love this part of the game. It's short, but it's honestly a really genius idea. Whoever came up with this needs a raise. We find Black Raven and we take him down, but he tries to use his machine to force a ton of dinosaurs to come and attack us. But before they can make it, Nibbles uses dark energy to destroy the machine. And it leaves Black Raven stunned for a second before a light bulb goes off in his head. And he's like, Striker, you son of a bitch, before leaving back to the present, with our heroes having to haul ass back to their portal before it closes. However, before they can reach the portal, a stray boulder hits us and totals our ride. We're about to be stuck here, but Nibbles valiantly sacrifices himself to save everyone. In the present, Tri is actually going through a pretty heavy depression arc that I'm sure can hit close to home for anyone who's lost somebody important to the- You did not just have him roll into the goddamn depression arc, what is wrong with you? But thankfully, our buddy here- no. Dahlia here comes up with a dummy mission to try and get Tria out of her funk. I really haven't given Dahlia enough credit, she's a really sweet character. I know I said the dumbass stereotype was my favorite, but Dahlia really is the OG of that group. She's amazing. And when her and Tria get a closer look at the object they found, they realize it's a part for a bone buggy that's somehow millions of years old. Which actually gives the two of them an idea. You see, earlier in the game you help out this guy who found an ancient looking dino gear. Which actually sets up a fun callback to Diggins in the original game as Tria throws out the dino gear and out pops Nibbles, bringing our heroes back together. And after a little tummy ache, he even gets a new form! That's strangely familiar to me for some reason. Eh, probably not important. But that's not all the good news, as Black Raven was captured and now a huge tournament is being held in celebration. It's a tournament where all the people you face are actually the same paleo pals you've been training up throughout the game, leaving you with only a few at your disposal. This is actually a pretty fun idea, as if you didn't use a Paleo Pal, they're actually really weak when you fight them. And if you use one a lot, they're still really weak because of this bum-ass battle system. This does bring up an issue with the Paleo Pals, and that's that most of them are only available in the post-game, which is ridiculous because there's nothing to do in the post-game except like three tournaments and online battles. And I don't want to play any more of this battle system. The only Paleo Pals you can use in the tournaments are the ones that aren't Wardens, which is most of them at that point. And you'll only have two from the main storyline who aren't Wardens. There's a couple side quests you can do to get more, but I don't know why so many are stuck in the post game when they would have been more usable beforehand. I'll get into Paleo Pals' as characters a little bit later. For now, let's just continue on with the story. After winning the tournament, because of course you do, Nibbles is actually dino-napped by Black Raven and taken to his secret submarine. Apparently the Black Raven that was captured was a robotic fake instead of the real thing. Okay, I guess they didn't use metal detectors in that prison. I mean, Black Raven is pretty much a cyborg, so maybe they thought it would be pointless, but... The prison really should have... Why am I even bothering at this point? After losing track of Black Raven, Striker comes clean about Nibbles and how he's actually the ultimate dark vivisaur created by Black Raven. Which brings up the question of why you would send Tria and Nibbles anywhere near Black Raven. I feel like that's a terrible idea that risks the chance of Black Raven discovering who Nibbles was, which was totally what just happened in Dino Land. Again, why am I even bothering? We know this plot is dog shit at this point, so let's just finish it up. After another round trip across the globe and some more assistance from Elric Ex Machina, we finally make it inside of Black Raven's base of operations and blast through his two sets of guards. Who the fuck cares? We make it to Black Raven and he reveals that Nibble's original dark form has finally been completed. Would you like to guess what happens next? Is it A. Nibbles eats Tria and the credits roll. B. Striker shows up and helps because why the fuck wouldn't he be here right now, that useless piece of shit? C, the power of friendship triumphs all. Or D, Todd and Rosie come in on Zonga Zonga's puppeted corpse and they step on that little dweeb Nate and save the day. Ah, uh, we all know that C is the correct answer, but D would have been fun. Nibbles is back to normal, completely expelling the dark energy from his body and becoming his ultimate form, the Crimson Ravenger. Black Raven decides that he's fucked no matter what, so he fuses himself with the dark energy and his giganto to form Dread Raven. 
whose perfect counter is the final form of nibbles that we just got two seconds ago. More like Dead Raven, am I right, gamers? With Dread Raven finally defeated, the gang returned back to base where they celebrate, ending on a scene with Elric basically telling us exactly what we already knew about him, and how he's from the future, and he's definitely going on my shit list, can't better make some room. Wow. That story really sucked. Like, I mean, seriously, the main plot doesn't kick in till about five or six hours in, the villains are the most uninteresting ones in the entire series, and the plot can only move forward because this OC looking future boy comes in from time to time to tell us the answers, and then he just leaves. I'm not a professional writer or anything, but I feel like this is basic shit you shouldn't be doing. There were parts of the last two games that kind of felt fillery, but it was all in service to our character's main goal of becoming the best fighter. Trias spends so much time throughout the main plot just being a gopher to problems that really shouldn't need her involvement until the BR bandits just show up and that just becomes what's happening now. Nibbles was at least pretty interesting, but the arc with him becoming a good little vivisaur was just kind of done as soon as we met him. And from there, he's just along for the ride, even though it feels like he's the main thing this plot should revolve around. Everything from Black Raven was just so uninteresting. He doesn't even have a reason for wanting to take over the world. He's just evil and his henchmen are just nothing but the most stock of stock bad guys. You got the one that's brainwashed, the one that loves just being a dick. You can do something interesting with all this, but they don't. It is kind of fun to have a main villain be a normal human, however. Maybe we can do our own sort of we are the monster type of thing. The whole process of reviving Vivasaurs is kind of fucked up when you think about it. The last game literally compared it to necromancy. It would be interesting to have a more teeth type situation where Black Raven and the other scientists, between all the radioactive skulls and scientifically created Vivasaurs, had a real Spy Kids 3 moment of God stays in heaven because he too lives in fear of what he's created? Or hell, maybe we could do something with the dragons as the main plot. Like maybe Black Raven is traveling around the world corrupting that region's dragon to try and make a dark dragon army. And then we could have dragons versus dinosaurs, and maybe each part of the world can have a different type of dragon. I don't know, that just sounds pretty interesting. I mean, in the last game, we literally had dinosaurs evolve into dragons. And then we got a dragon in this game, it just kind of feels like we got dragons, but we're not doing anything with them. Like, what's with that? But, you know, we didn't get any of that stuff. Instead, we got a lame villain plot that uses time travel, but doesn't follow any of its own rules. Since the first game with Dr. Dickens and his sandals, it was set up that when something happens in a timeline, it just happens and the universe instantly corrects itself to make it so. That's why we find Diggin's sandals before we see him go back in time. That's why we find Nibble's dino gear before he goes back in time. It was just always gonna happen. So there are no alternate timelines or any of that shit. So when you send Black Raven back in time and nothing happens, I have no reason to believe that his plan worked. Because if it did, it would've. We don't see anything slowly change, or any vivisaurs actually go wild like the Rugrat says. Nothing happens, so I assumed he failed. Of course, by said logic, if he did succeed, then maybe then this would have become a paradox of if the world was always like this, how did he ever go back? But that's putting way more thought into this than any of the writers did. And they could have explained this at any time if they wanted to. Elric is right there throughout the story, not so subtly trying to push us in the right direction. Then at the end of the game, he admits to have broken all the rules of time travel by helping us. So I don't even know why he was here in the first place if he can't get involved or do anything. Which, not like there's any repercussions for breaking the rules, in quotes, since Elric decides to just stay in the present anyway, so who cares? And let's not act like they needed to try and stay in continuity with the first game and how it did time travel. Frontier is pretty much a soft reboot. Things like the Callisteo Fossil Park are mentioned to exist and there's plenty of things that call back or sort of homage things like Dino Gigante and Sorehead. 
but like I think it's more those two game locations exist but their stories didn't really happen or at least they're just not the way we know they happened which would explain why so many things are different. I've not really gone to the setting of this game very much, it's essentially a globe-trotting adventure and I think it does this decently well, with the three fossil parks having all three dig sites throughout Asia, Europe, and the Americas. I would have liked to see a location or two maybe based on Antarctica, Africa, or Australia, but the selection we got really isn't bad. I'm fine with the setting for the most part, it's really interesting. Though, maybe we could have given sub names for these parks? I mean, Fossil Park America doesn't hit the same as Callisto or something like that. I kind of wish maybe that the settings of the last games could have been revisited, you know, since it's a globe trotting adventure. But like I said, it's a soft reboot, so it wouldn't have been the same place that we know anyway, and maybe the wardens just don't got jurisdiction there. They probably did all that in case they wanted to have more options for future games. But before I touch on that, let's look at the Paleo Pals a bit more, because I haven't really dove into them enough as characters. For the most part, they're all just kind of decent characters with their own personalities. You got the prim and proper guy, the edgy loner, the twins who love jewels, the mercenary, the murderer, <sighs> the hot one. Ow, fuck, is it really going to be the DS Dinosaur Games that's going to make me realize I have a type? Eh, I guess it's just how it goes. But yeah, all the Paleo Pals are all pretty decent characters, which they do kind of all have to be to really sell this battle system. Nobody wants the perfect Vivasaur for their team to be stuck on some lame character. A lot of the dialogue and writing in this game is pretty good and pretty funny. It's just a few stinkers here and there and you know the story itself that I have a problem with. I mentioned Roland a few times and I think the game just overused his joke way too much. It was all he really was by the end of the game, which was really disappointing. There is a quest line though that's tied to him that's all about weight loss, which I thought would have been interesting, but it pretty much was just this really bizarre thing where they strapped him to an engine that ran off his weight, and by the end it almost killed him. Which is another reason why Professor Little needs a chaperone or something, but I really thought that maybe the message of this quest would be that there is no shortcut to weight loss, and there's a lot of dangerous scams out there that can really hurt you. That would have been a pretty interesting message to teach kids who don't understand that stuff. Instead, they kind of stopped short and did this more body positive style message where Roland gains all his weight back and decides to ROLL ON! Which, you know, good on them. This game is absolutely right with the message that you don't need to have a certain body type to be loved. Though, it does feel a little bit shallow afterwards when you go straight back to having him roll around like that. You know, maybe this is my own struggles with weight loss coming through. Haha, <laughs> the shallow named Chubby had weight issues. But I kind of felt like maybe this questline subject matter could have been handled a little bit better. Especially with a child audience in mind, and maybe having Roland learn to love himself while trying to become healthier the right way would have been a great message for kids. I know I could have used it when I first played this game. Holy shit, I'm just projecting my insecurities onto this character. What the fuck does that mean? Does that mean I'm wrong about him? Or does that mean I'm right about it? Does it mean I'm crazy? Does it mean I should apologize about thinking the other stereotype was funny? Or is that even the same thing? Or is that not the same thing? Oh my god, my entire humanity is being unraveled because of a dumbass cartoon character on a 3DS. Holy shit, I have got to get out of the house more. This is fucking ridiculous, man. What the fuck? <laughs> Alright, we got a little too deep there. Uh, how about let's show on Nate for a little bit. So after we had Rosie, who was the dope little side protagonist, and Todd, who was the definite GOAT of the whole series, why on God's green earth did we get this quirked up white boy with no sauce? and his dumbass mutt who killed his grandfather? Nate's just the worst best friend character, man. They build him up to be a sort of side protagonist, kind of like what they did with Rosie and Todd at the beginning of the game. And then he just doesn't appear for the rest of the game outside of this stupid joke here and there where he puts his butt in front of the wild animal and smacks it. And then he gets mad that the wild animal bit his ass. This was never funny, except for the first time, and only because you can make Trya a smartass about it. Then, later on in the game, when Nibbles is on his deathbed and needs help, 
He basically tells everybody to just let it go since it bit his ass after he kept putting it in front of him and smacking it. Don't give me this bullshit, man. I don't even care that you came through in the end. Nate is the worst, man. I can't believe this is your version of the friend character after having one of the best written characters in monster taming. Yeah, I said it. Todd is one of, if not the GOAT for now and forever. And that's Fossil Fighters Frontier, a lame send off to an otherwise perfect series. I mean, sure, it had a lot of cool elements and ideas, but they changed too much, and really, this game honestly could have been in its own series. Like, easily, if it wasn't for the fossil cleaning in the title, you could have convinced even the die-hard fans that this was from a different series of games. Look, I can understand that maybe since this team mostly comprised the new people, they wanted to do their own take on the series and maybe even grab a hold of new fans. I can respect that. To a point. But Frontier wasn't interesting enough to gain a new fan base, and it did nothing but alienate the one they already had. This story is straight garbage, and that's just not acceptable since the last two games had amazing stories. That weren't perfect, but they held my interest the whole time and they were just fun. And do I even need to talk about the dumbass gameplay again? Look, the visuals are really good. The animations are all well animated, you know, when you can see them. The comedy's funny, the music was fantastic. I even liked the cars. But that was not enough to save this game. Fossil Fighters is such a creative and fun series. My appreciation for it has grown all throughout this retrospective. And I genuinely implore you to give these games a shot if you haven't already. The first two games are fantastic RPGs, and though I don't recommend the third one as much, I'd still say if any of what you saw here caught your interest, it may be worth looking into. But hey, compared to the other two, Frontier won't burn a hole in your wallet. Or at least it won't yet. Man. I mentioned at the beginning of this retrospective that I think Fossil Fighters has a shot of coming back. I still agree with that statement. Frontier burned a lot of bridges, but it's never not possible for a series to return. Fossil Fighters has a very dedicated fan base, and although I don't believe 99% of the leaks about Nintendo, I still think there is a reason that Fossil Fighters rears its head in some of those, alongside F-Zero and Mother. I think if they take the lessons from Frontier and keep what's good from it and replace what was awful with more elements from the first two games, I think you'd have a real moneymaker on your hand. I mean, can you imagine a Fossil Fighter 4 with an open world where you and your friends can get in bone buggies and fight wild vivasaurs and dig up fossils? Pokemon and Mario Kart are serious moneymakers. Imagine if you combine them into one game. Hell, Pokemon's already kind of doing that in Scarlet and Violet. I know people don't like the buggies, but the problem there was the execution, not the idea itself. I will die on this hill. You cannot convince me that an online open world Pokemon Mario Kart fusion with dinosaurs wouldn't sell. That is literally the coolest idea of all time. Whew. The Fossil Fighters retrospective is finally finished. I had promised to do this completed video all the way back in August last year, and it's about time I finally compiled and edited the different videos into one complete package. And I hope you enjoyed it if you're a new viewer of these videos, and if you're an old viewer, then I hope you enjoyed all the new jokes and edits added in. But most of all, I really need to thank all of you. It's no exaggeration to say that this series of videos have been the most popular and beloved pieces of content I've ever put out. I get a grin on my face every time I see a notification pop onto my phone, telling me that another Fossil Fighters fan has enjoyed my videos and expressed it to me in the comments. I'm genuinely happy that all of you really love these videos that I worked so hard to make. It really does make the process of creation so much easier. These videos are really tough to make, but the thought of people loving and enjoying them makes it all worth it. Truly, thank you all for everything. The kind words and the comments, the suggestions that really made me think on where to take my videos in the future. The critiques telling me exactly what I needed to fix for this combined video. Seriously guys, thank you so much for helping me with that. 
and of course, all the likes and subscribes. Even if you didn't do any of that and you only viewed the videos, I'm still happy that you did and I hope you enjoyed every second of them. This project was a joy to make, but honestly, without all the support from you guys, it wouldn't be even a quarter as fun. Genuinely, thank you all. I really mean it. And now, because I'm an asshole, I'm going to make you regret watching this long into the video by playing that dumb meme I made in October. Sorry not sorry, boys. Something about that Frankenstein's ass grab really cracks me up. Ah. Yeah, I had to get one more pun in for the road. Thanks again, everybody.